please put at Von Art. But as we like to start these, if you could put where you're watching from, we do a shout out before we get going and as people are joining in. Uh, today's gonna be a little different. We're gonna be talking or doing a lot of talking and very little to any drawing because we're gonna be talking about conventions. And this is more for those that are thinking about getting into it. Maybe they have an interest in, is this something I want to do or pursue for myself? Uh, we're gonna go into both aspects of conventions. So we're gonna talk about the artist, kind of the fun side of things. And then we're gonna also talk about the business side, which really isn't seen as the most fun, but I think I can try to make it more fun for you. I see it like a game and play to win. So when I think of the business side of conventions, I try to treat it like Monopoly or Clue or any other game that you would play and try to have the best game for yourself. So. I'm going to try to put as many cards in your hand so that you can play them at these cons. And yeah, so if you could put that uh, where you're watching first, I'm pretty sure I'm done with the marketing, but we're going to wait until a few people join in. And thank you. Oh, who was that? Oh, I could oh, not read that if I tried. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but for those who are new, I'm Tim. I'm Von Art on Instagram, and this is Sean Price, Art of Price. Hi. And the reason that... I think this will be a good stream because we have two different perspectives where I've been doing conventions for five years. There it is. Pebo Pobes 87 for following. Thank you. Oh, I still have the hearts. That's right. And oh, we'll keep the hearts. I like yeah, I like that. Oh, that didn't change the pile at all. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dead heart, let me tell you. Uh, but I'm five years into doing conventions, or this is my fifth year. Sean is his second year. And it's been kind of interesting because I feel like we met at C2E2 and he's been kind of absorbing all the knowledge and sponging it as much as he can from the advice that we've been sharing. And I, I also do have convention experience. That's true. The tattooing world. Sean used world. to be a tattoo artist. And I think you're one of the artists that are really good at acknowledging the knowledge that you're receiving and kind of filtering of what do I actually want to take in? What do I want to apply to my booth? And then actually doing it. Thanks. I appreciate that. And... I want you to, you guys to be more like Sean if you are interested in conventions too. And I think sometimes we get very defensive about the goals yeah. or the paths that we have set for ourselves. Be but open. if you can swallow your pride <laughs> yeah, for a bit seriously. and just take in any knowledge that you can, doesn't mean you have to use it or utilize it. But as long as you're listening and maybe something is clicking in your head, uh, I feel like that goes a long way. Be open to change a yeah. lot when it comes to your boot. Like, like never have like especially like when it comes to like how making like a booth and everything like that or like an idea of a booth like it's i feel like it's constantly going to be changing because you're going to mm -hmm. be making new work you're going to be trying different things you're going to be trying to display different things so don't ever go into it and be like okay like this is my booth and i have to work around this idea always be open to just a new display even if it's like every like convention you know but still have a solid idea of displaying it i couldn't have said it better mm -hmm. Uh, oh man, these are so hard to read. Thank you, Kikiomi, for following. Kikiomi. All right, so why don't we do the shoutouts and we'll jump right into it because I have three pages of notes worth that I want to okay, share with you yeah. guys. I'm just here today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tishel says, "Bird, bird, bird, bird is the word." Bird is the word. Yeah, I, I did a little mock up of what me and Sean sell. I just sell ob <laughs> obligatory animal and art and profiles. So... Aw, I mean, yeah, you look pretty sad in the drawing too, but. <laughs> You look okay here. You look sad today. Uh, so why don't we... Oh, Whoa, that cannoli. was the same time. It was Kikiomi. Kikiomi. Oh, let's see here. Um, yeah, where are we starting? Where is this? Oh, you know what? We'll, or no, yeah, we'll do the shouts first. Then I have only two announcements that I have to do. Okay. Okay, I think from right here. So Tidal says, hey, I'm watching from under Sean's hat. Mm -hmm. The sketch is so cute. Ah. I, you know what's funny is pulling up my Cintiq. I haven't drawn on it in a long time. How was it? Uh, actually, not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe Polo says, hi from the Netherlands. Manga Sketch says, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Jay Fordota says, hi from Argentina. Cole Wheeler says, hello from Texas. Phantom September says, hello from Finland. Abzel says, hi from Saudi Arabia. Leo says, hi from Italy. Oh, if there's something that you want us to call you besides your screen name, we have a list on the side here. We're Actually, I think we're getting pretty good at remembering like all of Jim, these. right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Jim says, hey, uh, from work. Hmm. <laughs> hello. Uh, e. M. Mistano says, hello from New York City. Guy Webb says, hi from Malta. Gray says, howdy from Texas, darlings. Nikita says, hello from Canada. Hey, uncanny. 
Uh, Bran, I should call you, says hi from Atlantis. How are you doing from down there? Likewise, says hi from North Carolina. Uh, this tea is too sweet. Tea is says too hi from sweet. Illinois. I like that one. That's a good one. Femme says, Ayo from Belgium. Four cuties on screen today. I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> I know be, that. Uh, I know. You know what would have been that a great owl pun, is though? so cute. No, I was going to like lift four <laughs> clementines. <laughs> you should have. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Right? Uh, let's see here. Where were we? Nico says, so sorry I couldn't make it to Anime Milwaukee. Love all you guys in the Von House. Hello from Milwaukee. Well, hello. Oh, you should have came. You're from Milwaukee. How's it going? That's okay. One day. Turtle Turtle or Lars says, hi from Germany. Mitten from Columbus. Mitten. Mitten. You're going to get yelled at. <laughs> Ashley's going to yell at you. <laughs> this tea is too sweet. Just get, uh, should I go down to the other one? Um, I guess really quick, this right. video will probably be saved on YouTube. So, oh, okay. yes. Uh, Lopa says hello again from Iceland. Just dropping in, say hi. Since conventions are definitely not something I'm even close to doing, but have fun with the stream. Well, <laughs> thank you. We definitely will. At least the first half. I know when the business side comes up, I'm sure the viewer rate will just like plummet so fast. <laughs> but I think it's <laughs> yeah. important for you guys to also be interested in the business side as well as just the fun art side. So hopefully you guys stick around if you're yeah, actually. Yeah, this interested. one I think is going to be more of like a podcasty. Yeah, type. I think so too. Talk. So just letting you know, Smack City. <laughs> oh hello Saint again from st louis wax one lion says hello from argentina i'm assuming that's jibbert jibbert yeah hello from puerto rico joslin says hiya plymouth minnesota baby b kaufman says hey from michigan red panda with a four says hello from croatia and i can't read that last one beautiful yeah. okay <laughs> So the only announcements I have is we were at Anime Milwaukee last weekend. It was a great show. Oh, wait. Show. We got one more. Great show. Greg, Greg, Greg says, hey, hello from the other side of the world, Indonesia. Hey. Oh, hello my. from way out there. Hello from Indonesia. And I That's give crazy. A... We got people watching from Indonesia. That's I weird. I know. We live in this little tiny little thing right here. <laughs> and then you guys are all the way in Indonesia or like Belgium or Croatia. Places I've never been. Places you've never been. And you guys They're are watching not. us like right now. That's weird. I'm losing it. I'm going to have an existential moment. I got to go <laughs> for a second. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> we were at Anime did, Milwaukee like, last weekend, <laughs> and I just want to give a quick shout out to Miss Chibi Artist. She has been following the stream for a while, and I feel that uh, she did a she really good job. Miss Chibi, hey. hey, I was just saying a shout out Where for you. you. Uh, if you guys don't know her, she basically was someone that I have met in person for the first time at last year's Anime Milwaukee, and I talked to her for a bit, and she decided that she was going to do it this year, and this was the first convention she's ever done, and I want to say... Congrats, Maria. I thought your booth was great. I heard that you made profit. You and did. it's something that I'm very proud of you for doing. So I want to give a shout out to you. And thank you again for that little fan art of Chase. It's definitely going on my wall. Thanks for that little pumpkin guy you gave me. Oh, yeah, I she saw that. That was cute. One, yeah. I like him. Uh, the other, other announcement she I also have. also gave Tyler something, too. Yeah, I saw that one, too. Yeah, you were great a busy job. little bee. Yeah. Uh, my Patreon la launched last Thursday, so if you guys are interested in seeing tutorials or exclusive content and actually my swordplay pages that I'm going to be releasing one a month, I have Red's backstory chapter. The first page is already out. You can read it, and I have little notes behind like what her, uh, who her brothers are and how she kind of fits into her world, so you can go check that out. And there's a link below. And the last thing that we always forget to do, but I didn't forget today, we have a Discord channel. Mm, there you go. And it is the community that we're building around this Twitch channel. And essentially what we're going to be doing is, I'm going to restructure it a little bit because we wanted to have challenges every week, but we're kind of finding out that it's probably better if we do one every month. And if that yeah, is something that interests up, you, yeah. well, just because we get so busy with conventions and things that are more fun have to be a lower priority than things that are more like... We need a financial done, yeah. return every month. Well, it's funny because we prep, I think, probably for about like a week before the con and everything like that, just to like yeah. get, make sure like our prints are in line and everything like that, especially the printing. Oh my God. It takes forever. Um, so, forever. Yeah, so we end up doing that. And so uh, the the stuff like the Discord and everything, the, the Discord challenges, like coming up with new challenges every week and everything like that, it, it tends to, we tend to, it, it's like Wednesday and we're like, oh, oops. Yeah, so, so I think a monthly thing makes more sense. But if you guys want to join it, basically it's a community of like-minded artists and we're there to share our own work. We get critique, share any movies or tutorials that you've seen online. It's just basically a, a small little hub for artists to go and hopefully connect with. And I've we've already met a few great artists. I feel like Melpa mm -hmm. was an artist that I didn't know about 
And then she kind of came into this community, and wow, did she yeah. blow me away. So, yeah, you might meet some really cool artists while oh, you're in that wherever Discord. Wherever you are, I hope you're doing great. Yeah, right? Okay, so I think we're going to jump kind of into it. But if you guys have questions along the way, I mean, this is supposed to be a back and forth stream, but I think it's also important for you guys to know that I kind of have an agenda for what I want to at least say to you. So I'm going to try to get as much as it out, but I also want to answer as many questions as possible. I have no notes. Sean has no notes, but I feel like that's a good representation of us as people. <laughs> Sean likes to just jump into things. I like to be prepared and I plan. So I guess that says a lot about our convention. I'm just off, we the, talk yeah, about off the top of the head. Okay. So conventions. I guess to start off, convention. what is a convention? Because I had to explain it to my family because I don't think they still <laughs> I have to quite put understand. the odor on because I think I smell. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. Uh, so a convention is basically a, I don't want to say a collection. It's a gathering of either a small amount of people to a large amount. And that could range from like 500 people to 120,000 people. So there's definitely a big range of the amount of attendees that can be there. And it's usually more focused on comic or anime. Now, there are different cons that are more focused on like high fantasy art or uh, board games. You'll see those pop up or like Monster Palooza. And while those are great, those are definitely the minority in comparison to an anime and comic uh, con. And I think it's pretty obvious what the difference between an anime and a comic con is. But just to give you a little uh, insight, uh, anime con usually has a younger audience usually is more focused on anime and has more of a japanese eastern type seller market base where comic cons they're generally a little older you see people definitely way yeah. more into like marvel and mm -hmm. tv shows i would say tv is just as big as comic at comic shows yeah uh, celebrities are usually an important aspect of conventions. You still have anime booths at Comic Cons, mm -hmm. but it's it's definitely not like, way outnumbered. Yeah, yeah. And those are basically the twos that you should be aware of. And the things that I want to go over with you guys are the back end, the products, presentation, expenses, actual profit, and what to bring. So we're gonna go through all that and then we're gonna split it into an art side and a business side. And we're gonna start with the art side. But before we do that, why should you do cons? And I guess Sean, why do you do cons? Because you guys told me, you, you, you got, you guys told me to. <laughs> no, we drag Sean no. along. He wants out no, so bad. No, no, no. Cons are, yeah, no, <laughs> no. Cons are actually, um, well, I mean, it's, it's a good way, of course, to create revenue. But the biggest thing I think is just getting your work out there, showing your work. At least to me, I always like showing my work to to as many people as I can. Um, exposure was exposure, my number one yeah, thing yeah, yeah. on exposure my little Exposure is, is, I think, is probably the big one. Because it builds your audience. It builds your audience of where people can see your work and then you create more of an audience and then people, you get people like fans and people supporting your work more. Um, so yeah, I mean, exposure, I think is probably the big one. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. my number one. I also wrote networking, profit. Yeah. And then the ones that are kind of fun would be to have fun, friends, and if you need to find roommates. And that's <laughs> the reason I go to conventions. But I thank you, Captain Carroll, for following. Thank you, Captain Carroll. And... That's why cons for me, it's, it's more than just making money and like making enough to pay rent. I mean, I have so much fun at conventions Oh yeah. and the people that we meet, I don't know. I feel like it's always a it's, blast. It's always it's a new a, experience. It's always funny because like cons and even this, this even happened in like the, uh, like tattoo conventions that I would do and everything is when you go to, when you go to a con, it's like this own little like reunion party that you have to where you get to see people that you've met at other cons, and especially if they're like an active con goer too, um, like a, a, an artist or exhibitor, or even like people who go to cons like regularly, like annually, yeah. um, you get to meet those people and like you get to see them again. You're like, oh, hey, like, how's it going? So I don't know. It's like a little reunion party sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think Sean's seen it more now, but when we go to cons and Pui and I have been doing it for five years now, I mean, we've met so many artists that go to these conventions behind the boots and that's really the only time we get to see them. So for us, it's kind of a reunion of other artists and like-minded people that it's kind of nice going to dinner with them and sharing experiences from someone that kind of already knows your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then you can get past that weird, hey, like, what do you like to do? Like, you already know. Like, obviously, if they're behind a booth selling stuff too, you already kind of have an idea of what they're interested in. 
so you can just have a good time. And usually, the last time we went to OhioCon, we just went to a club and we brought like four or five of the artists oh, yeah, that we were there. Yeah, we brought a bunch of, a bunch of and people with we us. And we had a really good time. It was a, it was a great night. So definitely, I see it more as, or I see it not just as a way to make profit, because I think that is the number one goal of why we do this. We want to make a return on mm -hmm. our products. But I think exposure and networking and having fun are like equally as important if yeah. you give it that. I would think exposure would, exposure and profit, I mean, would probably be the number one reasons why you go, of course, to a con. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like how I just threw it back? I was like, yeah, you said it all. <laughs> repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. <laughs> also, guys, if you have any questions, remember to put at Von Art, um, and then we'll try and get yes. to your questions as much as we can. I know we're probably just going to be talking a lot today, though. Let's answer the questions that we have after I get these two things. Sure. So right there. All right, so the next thing I wrote down is, are you, <laughs> are you ready to do them? The short answer, yes. There... Why did it not pick that up was those? beautiful that, yo, what Yee. happened? yes there you go yes you are there is no right time to start doing conventions and i'm going to show you guys my own convention journey in just a second my initial booth looked kind of horrible and i'm not going to try to sugarcoat it either but if i didn't start doing them i wouldn't have grown and learn and i <laughs> i want to say this without it sounding uh misplaced but I want you guys to fail and I want you guys to fail a lot. No, you're supposed to. And yeah. And I failed so often in the first two years that I lost a lot of money. And that's why my initial, my other note that I wrote here was the initial cost of doing cons is high. And I can understand why that actually might prevent you from starting to do cons. But even though the initial cost is high, it'll pay off in the long run. It's that whole idea of spend a nickel, make a dime. So you might be thinking, well, why is the initial cost so high? Well, I wrote down just four that came in my head immediately, and it was the boot setup. So I'm talking like the drop tablecloth, the actual poles, the things to hold your prints, anything that might involve the boot setup. Secondly, the booth cost itself. Boots are not cheap at some of these cons. Some of them are like 400 average, yeah. and we've paid for ones that are over 1,000. So that can be a big expense. Third one, traveling and lodging expenses. Sometimes you have to drive to a show. Sometimes you have to fly to one. And then while you're there, you have to either stay at a hotel or an Airbnb. That can also be kind of pricey. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one are your actual products. And prints can, and it can be expensive if you do a lot of misprints. But in a weird way, that's actually probably your lowest expense out of the four. What is? Products. If you do your prints right and you don't have a lot of them, like let's say you have 10 prints. Well, you got to think so like with us, we do self-printing. Yes. So like that doesn't... We're going to talk about that. Yeah, that that doesn't cost a lot as compared to... Well, no, no, no. Goes That's in. more expensive than printing online. Is it? Uh-huh. Tyler's prints are like 59 cents per print. Um, Ours are like $1.14. Um, but I'll talk more about numbers in the business it's side. It's the quality. It's the quality. It's the quality. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. no he, no i'm i am not it is <laughs> uh okay so i'm gonna share with you guys <laughs> a little journey down my first time doing con so i want to give you guys some perspective of how where i came from and why i think it's good to show maybe not the brightest parts of my career to kind of give you an idea that yeah i failed a lot and i'm not really ashamed of it so my first booth was back in 2014. I did C2E2, which is Chicago's, or actually really the Midwest's biggest convention that they have. Mm -hmm. And I shared half a booth. So on this <clears> side <throat> was my old roommate, Gabe, Gabo. And he gave me half his booth. And what I did was I made some buttons because I saw that that's what was popular at the time. I'd, I've gone to conventions before and I was like looking at all these other booths that had buttons. And I kept thinking, I can do that. I can do that. And I, I brought a bunch of them up here. I'm not going to show all of them. I just wanted to show key because I had a lot of buttons. And the big thing about this was I individually hand popped every single one. Who's this? That's lightning from Final Fantasy 13. <laughs> Clearly not a very good lightning if you can't tell who it is. Okay. And for all of my prints, I printed them on the front and the back side. And on the back, I did like a tutorial on how I made that print and a small description of it. Now that's not typical, but I try to go extra. And I think that's something that I've always done throughout my life is I go extra, I go the extra mile. And yeah, there's times where I'll stumble or I'll hit roadblocks. I kind of realized that that 
may not be the best way to go about doing prints. Bad pin? I did. Once, if you guys want to see my little Walter White. <laughs> oh my lord. Yeah, right. And the other thing that I wanted to make a note of here was that I did a lot of Office Max runs. The only two things I wrote down for my first few cons were buttons and Office Max. I remember going to Office Max three to five times the week of the con and making my prints there or printing what were, let me show you. Do you see these papers over here? I would print four by six, or no, four by five circles on eight and a half by 11 paper. I would individually hand cut all of the pins out and then I would put them in the popper, put the clear enamel or whatever, I forgot what it was called, on top the plexi coat, the backing, pop it, and then move on to the next. And I would cut every single one. And at the time, I thought this was a great idea because you're making $2 per pin, and they cost me like a dollar to make. I was making a 50% profit. At the time, I thought that was great. But as we're going to talk about the business side of things later on the stream, not so much. And actually, you're not taking into account the time it makes to each, each of these pins. And for a $2 product, it's Something that is not worth it for me anymore, but I'm glad I had of, that experience. It does hurt you in the long run, especially when it comes to people looking at things at your booth, because I think oh, yeah. of all of us as people, um, we, at least, I mean, unless you have $10 million, um, I think all of us like to not spend a lot of money. So yeah. when you have something that's such a low number at your booth, People, I think you're, they're more than likely to go for the $2 product rather than like the $15 product. Ah, yes. That's something I definitely want to talk about later mm -hmm. because Sean's absolutely right. And if they buy your pins instead of a print, imagine your booth's $400. Do you know how many pins you would have to sell to make up that booth? Quick math. Don't look at me. 800 pins. That's how many pins you'd have to sell to make up just the cost of the booth. Is. So. Once you kind of realize the numbers that go on, it becomes a lot easier to decide, is this worth it, is it not? And you can see, like, this is the template that I use. I would give it to you guys, but honestly, I don't recommend making buttons, and I hope that you guys can learn from my failure. But I'm not going to say don't do it. If there's something that you guys want to go after, this whole stream, I'm going to just show you things that I think have worked and have not. Pins for me, while they worked at the time, in the hindsight, I want to say that they didn't work. And I... If you guys want to do them, great, but I don't recommend them. The other thing that I tried to do was stickers. I realized quickly that stickers were kind of the same avenue as buttons, so I decided to actually scrap them after I finished uh, drawing and stickers coloring are, two of them completely. I always think stickers should be, if you do make stickers, at least in my opinion, I think stickers, instead of uh, selling them, I think you should just add them into your prints just for like a free yeah. little thing. Absolutely. You know, if you do want to make stickers, because I, I think... Or like a all, business card. I think we all have a kind of a thing to where we like stickers. I do like stickers. Yeah. And then the third thing was sculpts. Stickers. This was something that... Do they call them stickers in London or the UK? I think so. But with sculpts, one of my older mates, Corinna, she was definitely a good example for me to see that sculpts definitely do sell her like little figures, mm -hmm. but the process of recreating and uh, restocking your inventory was so tedious and i i was there i was through a lot of the pain with her on trying to re-pour this cast in resin and yeah it's kind of a pain in the butt so there is a market for sculpts definitely but i think it's up to you guys if you are a sculptor to kind of figure out what path you should go down to mass produce them and 3d printing is definitely a big thing nowadays but if you're a traditional sculptor Definitely look into the easiest way to pour a bunch of molds where you can pop them out quickly and efficiently. Okay. And I think... Oh, yeah. I just wanted to show... So my booths throughout the year. And then we'll go into the art side, but then we'll answer questions before we get and jump into that. Mm. So my first booth... the art side? Yeah. All right, cool. So this I, will be... like a million of them. I'm just like seeing <laughs> them. Um, so my booth at C2E2... I was still working at CG Cookie, so I was half trying to promote CG Cookie and half kind of selling my own stuff. It was mostly original art, which I kind of forget that I sold mostly original, and then this was the fan art section over here. But as I started growing, ignore this human in front of my booth, clearly it's all fan art. And then this whole CG Cookie thing was promo, and then my originals got pushed to just this little section over here. This is a lot to look at. This is a lot to look at. My booth became very cluttered, but in a weird way, this is actually when I started making a lot of money. I will talk about 
a cluttered booth versus a more streamlined booth too later on. And this definitely kind of pushes over into the cluttered side, but I still think it's somewhat organized if I can critique myself a bit, just because there's so much going on. And you can't tell if it's a fan art, is it original? How much are the prices on each? And I was very proud of the booth at the time, but like what Sean said at the beginning, you can't ever stop evolving. Be obsessed with improvement. Mm -hmm. And if you ever settle, and I don't want to call anyone out, but there's definitely artists that we've met that they haven't changed their booth over amount of years. And then we just hear them about how they aren't making profit anymore. And I tell them, and I try to be honest with them and be like, well, have you thought about kind of rearranging your booth or thinking about differently? And yeah. I've even gone to their booths and critique them. I mean, they ask, I'm not like just going up to booths and be like, yeah, rah, yeah. Rah, rah, rah. but I think it's good for you guys to recognize that. Yeah. You might have a good boot setup now, or you think you have a good boot setup, but Always think, okay, well, what's next? I just think what can you, I do to improve it? I just it? think if your art is always going to be growing, then your presentation should also be growing as mm -hmm. well. Great way to say it. Here's me and my roommate, Tyler. Buff boys. Yeah, buff boys. Yeah, so buff. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you. Uh, but this is definitely when I went more the fan art route. And you can see the Mad Max, the Digimon. We got some Splatoon. And yeah, the originals got pushed to the side. And that's because I was following where I thought the market trend was going. And to me, that was a failure. But I'm really glad that I went down that path just to kind of see, is this worth it or is this the path I want to go down? And I don't show anyone, but I actually did have a booth under the name Nov. It was Von Backwards. And it was just a bunch of fan art head busts that I created that I will not show online anywhere. But I had like 20 of them and they were all fan art. So it was like V for Vendetta, Deadpool, just like a Batman, Spider-Man. It was just a bunch of superheroes because I was so bitter that uh, fan art was doing so much better. And I realized at the time it was because my fan art was outdated. While Digimon meant a lot to me, it wasn't a popular commodity at the time, where I think that was the same year that, what was the uh, last Zelda game before Breath of the Wild? Skyward Sword. That came out that year, oh, yeah. so there was a lot of uh, Zelda fan art, there was a lot of League fan art, and I did kind of do some of that. But if you are going to be I doing fan art... Skyward Sword. Most people do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think if you're going to go the fan art route, you have to also recognize that you're going to have to stay relevant. And every year, there's going to be different shows or movies that are the prominent things on people's mind and what they want to go buy because they might not have any. Like this year, Black Panther would be a good example. And people that make Black Devil Panther Devilman Crybaby. Devilman Crybaby. was a big one. So staying relevant of like what's current, what's cool with what people want, that's the path that you're going to have to take for, yeah, doing fan art. Yeah, that's what I was about to say, <laughs> especially if you're doing the fan art thing. Yeah, where originals, if your stuff is more on like a timeless realm where you can't tell, was it created 20 years ago? Was it traded now? That's kind of the route that we would recommend, and we'll talk about why later on. But I, I think it's good for you guys to see that my start was in fan art with like a little bit of original. And this was uh, last year, the beginning, where I kind of decided to scrap fan art. And yeah, my booth's a little jank look in here. And not saying that my booth got too much better now, but you can see how, okay, there's a theme going on. I'm seeing a lot of white and then gold was the I accent. It's jank. It's consistent. I, think, I mean, it's... It's, it's like, like the... Yeah, I mean, you have a little stands. bit of that, but the style of it, just because everything's in black and white, and then you have like this little tiny section of color that's kind of just sitting there. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. earlier this year, this was my booth set up at Ohio. And you can see how I'm, I'm clearly following that direction, that lead. But when I look at this, I'm like, how can I make this better? Mm -hmm. What is next that I can improve on? So while I'm very proud of where I've come from, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still think it's good to recognize that there's still more to go and never settle for where you're at. Okay, so let's answer some questions yes. here. And then we'll get into the art side and the business side. Where did we start here? Uh, oh, wait. Mighton says, do you guys have a hashtag for the challenges? We will. It'll be probably the hashtag Bonhouse challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, Fate says, how do you deal with having so much product? Clearly, I'm not at that point. I'm just curious. You, you have to cut down. Yeah, you retire it. You retire it. Mm -hmm. And even though you might have a personal emotional connection to it, you got to cut it out. Yeah. I think we've seen that with Pui, who has a lot of product. Or even Key. Actually, Key would be a good example. Or Gawky online. She has a lot of good art. But that doesn't mean you want to display all of it. Yeah. You want to keep it down to a minimum. I think a 20 is a good number. Around 20. So like 15 to 25 mm -hmm. might be a good range. Yeah. 
because if you have too much, all of a sudden your booth looks very cluttered and it's hard to decide for the viewer which one they want to buy because they're so overwhelmed by everything. But then if you have too little, all of a sudden you look like you're not a legit prepared. artist like or you're prepared not prepared. Or yeah, yeah. And understocked. You always want to feel, or you always want your booth to feel stocked. Just finding That's that, a big yeah, thing. Finding a sweet spot. It's funny, actually, I noticed at uh, Amkey that um, the ones that I normally sell, the brown drawings, like the little tiny homes that I had, yeah. Um, people didn't buy those as much anymore now because of like these blue and red drawings I've been doing. Yeah, my bigger prints and I'm, and I've been doing way more blue and red drawings now. So like those uh, ones are starting to phase out. I'm I don't think I'll ever like phase out the 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 tiny homes and everything like that just because I think there it is a very niche thing I think that people you probably like. will. Probably but will. yeah, I mean, but it, it it all depends if, you know, I don't know. Never say we'll never just happened. to be. Yeah. There. Never seen, never Digital says, Sean has no notes for life and still kills it. Mm. He definitely kills it. <laughs> Nikita says, will you be going to any cons in Canada? Uh, we wanted to go to... We tried to get into Calgary. Calgary con, they but they didn't respond, so we're hoping next year. Yeah, I definitely want to do a Canada con. Or no, Pui got in. Pui will for sure be there. Oh, I'm yeah. trying to buy Katie's booth. I might be there, actually. So we'll see. I'll I'll definitely let you guys know if that happens. I, it's funny because I got into the second round of, of calls, but I guess they didn't want me. <laughs> Aw. That's all right. Uh, hey, Katie says, hey, guys, I'm late, but I'm excited for the con talk as I'm getting ready for an art market thing right now, so it's super fitting. Mm -hmm. Hey, perfect. And we didn't even get to the actual <laughs> art yeah. more business side yet, so you, you didn't miss anything. Uh, Ebazel says, can you post a sketch in the Discord server? I really want to try to color it. Yeah. Uh, let me do that as soon as the stream ends. What? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Queen Cornetto says, I booked from, I'm booked i booked for my first con this year, but before I'm going to be selling at a smaller local art show, and I was wondering, say I'm selling mostly 8x11 prints and maybe some A2 ones. How many different pieces should I bring to sell? 20, around 20. Yeah, somewhere around there. 20 to... If you don't, if you don't have that many, like let's say you have 10. And everything like that. Um, <laughs> I'll save this out really quick for them. So the it, it's funny because I remember when I first started, I don't think I had that many prints. I think I had like twelve prints. Yeah, remember at like right. Indiana Cam, uh, Indiana Comic Con. Um, but what I did was at, at my table is I put out those multiple prints. Like I put out those things and I kind of like spread them out a little bit. So I put out like multiples of each print. So it kind of just looked like it filled up my booth. Yeah. Um, and then people like it was a lot easier rather than me having to like go like behind my booth and grab a print and give it to them. People could just like you know they hand you the money and they take it off the table and then you just which I do like up. that. You know, it is kind of a cheesy way to to fill up your booth a little bit. Um, but I don't know. I'm kind of a cheesy guy. Let's we all on. have our faults. Okay. <laughs> Alt Mage says, how does the U.S. deal with taxes on proximate? That I will talk about in the business side. Mm -hmm. that will, that's when the viewership will just <laughs> plummet. Mm -hmm. uh, Fate says, I'm C super... CPA. <laughs> just write it off right now. S Corp. Off. You guys are not going to like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Faithful Imagination. Fate says, I'm super struggling with finding a good banner that I can pack in my suitcase. I tried a vinyl banner, but it got ruined because I curled since it was rolled. Do you guys have any ideas? Oh, and I see Noise from Dramatical Murder. Yeah, Noise is one of my favorite character designs from a few years ago. Anyways, good banner. I also roll mine. Uh, Ashley would probably be the better one. Cloverkin would be better to ask because yeah. she has a vinyl. I, th I think she does roll it too. She does, I think. You don't want to fold it because the creasing in a vinyl will definitely stand out. So definitely roll it. But when you get to the con, roll it in the opposite direction. So essentially I'm uncurl it. What she, yeah, what she I'm pretty sure she it, uncurled yeah. it and then like held it in paperclip or something where it was clipped in the reverse direction mm -hmm. and then let it go and then it was more flat. Uh, definitely something that you want to at least test a few times. I know like when we went to Amkey, I realized my tablecloth was just horrible. So I was able to wash it back at home. But you want to be aware of those kind of things because presentation is key. And that's something that we're going to talk about in the art side of things. Yeah. So I don't want to jump the gun on that while we get these questions out first. The T is too sweet says, I've heard it's good to have a good mix between prints and small items since the small items are kind of like impulse buys. Would it be better to have a small amount of limited small items and a lot of prints or... Here, here's my perspective on it. And I think I wish Pui was here so we could talk about this. Pui cut out all of his small products completely mm -hmm. only has big products 
makes more money than all of us almost combined. But think of it this way, though. He's yeah. Okay, you go. All right. So I so think I know what you're say. here's what Pooey is that. So if he's cutting out small products, um, he's also essentially cutting out people who don't want to spend a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he's attracting people that do want to spend. Yeah, money. that do want to spend money. So it depends Start on what audience and market that you're going for. The thing that, and I think the other thing that Pui does right and why he can cut out small products is because his products, the quality is so pristine. His prints yeah. are very, very good, and he has a lot of talent and quality that's get put into the prints. So for him, having large prints makes sense, and that's why I'm slowly trying to cut my <laughs> small prints out. Oh, the sorry. OBS window is peaking <laughs> is what Tindall said. <laughs> it just wanted to hang out. What's so bad with OBS? You just want to be invited to the party. And that's something that I'm realizing. The more that I add these bigger prints, the more of a profit that I'm generating. And that's not to say that you should start with big prints, but maybe it is. Everyone's path is going to be a little different. So take the advice that we share with a grain of salt and realize that you could apply it, but also so things will work differently for you than they will for us. And what may work for us may not work for you. What may work for you may not work for us. But I think it's good to share and be as transparent as possible so that you guys can learn. Uh, Miss Chibi says, I had, or Maria says, I had the lady boothing next to me at Amkey tell me to rearrange my prints for the next day. So I switched my hanging prints to the opposite sides of my display. It seemed to help and gave people something else to see if they had come by several times. Hmm. That's something else I want to talk about later on is how you have to be open to critique and especially from those around you. So that was great that you took her advice yeah. and you applied it. <clears throat> I don't really see, I mean, I really don't see a problem with uh, switching your prints around. I think if you have a lot of prints, yeah, um, then it's going to be a little time consuming to switch them around. But I mean, hanging prints, if you have a few of them and you just want to switch them around, it's funny because our, our roommate Tyler here, I actually really love being booth next to him <laughs> because there's times where like he'll go through prints and then like in the middle of the day, he'll look at it and he'll be like, should I like move like this over here and this yeah. over here? And I'm just like, Tyler, do what you got to do. Day, a new every booth. day, every day. And he has a new booth. And it's <laughs> just like, I, but it works for him. So, you know, it all depends on really like the time that you want to put into it. I, remember, I, I don't know. I, it's kind of like, I don't know. It, 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 I, it's I, good. I, yeah. It's, it, it's good if you'd like to do it. It's good if you don't want to do it. Yeah. I guess, we'll yeah. leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, Chris says, I have most concerns with one, how much minimum inventory is needed for small cons? Uh, first question, I would say anywhere between five and 10 prints is like a safe zone. I think if you print less than five, you're entering the risk of having sold out prints everywhere. Really? I was not, that is such a low number. Oh my God. Five? Five? Yeah. No, well, for I would a say small 10, con. 10. I would say 10 for every print that you have. Minimum. The only thing is, though, when you're starting <laughs> I'm, off, like I'm paranoid, paying for though, 10 so. prints can be a lot of money, especially if you haven't sold at a con before. And that's why I printed 20 actually, back in the day. Here's my story with back in the day. When I had that c 2 e 2 booth, I printed 20 of every print. There were three prints that didn't really sell. I had just a stockpile of prints that didn't sell, especially when I did the Nav booth. I just had a bunch and I had to recycle all of them earlier this year. So be aware of how much you're printing. I think 10 is a good number for like a C2E2 or an ASIN. Or even when we went to OhioCon, I only brought five of each print and I did sell out. So Sean's right. Five can be a really low number. But if you're bringing a new print in, just be aware that it may not sell. That's true. So if you can afford it, I definitely do 10. But if you are really trying to like save money and cut costs, I would say five to 10. I did do another, that one print of the... Uh whatever I, I just brought in a new print and i printed out 15 and i sold two and uh so i was like well thankfully sean does enough cons where it can roll over mm -hmm. i mean it's still i mean it's still technically a hit like i mean that's, that's like ink that i've used and paper that i've used as well and everything yeah. like that so it's just kind of like you still take a hit from it you know so it depends on what you can afford and then two was how decent a scanner should i get since i'll have to print with a third party until i can afford a good printer the scanner was way more expensive than our printer. <laughs> so I guess take that with a grain of salt. Uh, our, we have Canon Pro printers, and with the discount, they're actually not that expensive. The scanner that we have, though, it's an Epson Museum quality scanner. So originally it was two grand. He and I found it for 1250 on Craigslist. I will say, though, Gabe used to have a scanner here. 
The Epson. He had, he had an Epson. It was an Epson printer. It also had a scanner on top of it. Anything that, that can scan up to 600 DPI. Yes. I think is, is what works. Yeah. Because you want to scan it at 300. And know that you'll probably have to do some editing in Photoshop anyways, because sometimes a scan will lighten. Unfortunately, it'll add a little bit of exposure to your mm -hmm. uh, original drawings, but that's an easy fix. Okay, let's see here. We'll do these three, and then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. Digital says, hang on. That last booth picture, are you drinking out of a Lego brick? I'm drinking out of it right now. Uh, Sean's mom got us these as little presents for all the roommates, so we all bring it to conventions. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Shout out <laughs> to Candy. Fate says, what I mostly mean by having too much products is you have to take like 50 prints of each drawing in all your sketchbooks. How do you fit it in a suitcase and transport it to the con? Tetris. Basically, uh, for Tetris. prints, you use one of those, one of those Binding divide, books. are they called divider binders? The ones that have like a different, a bunch of different slots yeah. for different prints. They're That's like how folder, I carry my eight like and a half by 11. Stuff, like folder and that fits in like, dividers. This kind of, a, I wish I had it on me, but essentially it's like a little box that you can Should carry. No. no, mine are in the van still. So that's the best way for small prints. Big mm -hmm. prints, we actually carry like in the boxes that the print that paper, the paper comes, comes in. in. So we are still in the process of doing something better because that is not a good process yeah, of doing we, it. We carry it in this. And there, and we just. The ones that Key and I have yeah. are a little bigger, but essentially, yeah. And you want to find something that will protect your print. So we do not recommend this. Do not. Practice what we're preaching with that. <laughs> and how do I fit in the suitcase? It uh, you have to buy one of those oversized suitcases yeah. and then pay the fee for accordion having a binders check on. is what they're called. Accordion binders. Thank, thank you guys. You, thank you. Yeah, Von or er, uh, Tigel, Yes, OBS. And last one from Faith says, when I did a small con, I never sold more than five prints except for one print, but that could mean multiple things. Yes, and. Even though I could, me and Sean could tell you all the advice we can about how That's to sell true. prints. That's true. These are all just very all, subjective. Yeah, very. Uh, th this is all just our opinions and our experience. Don't take these as final. Like, oh, like, well, they do that, so I have to do this mm -hmm. and everything like that. You do what works for you. You do what makes you feel the most comfortable and the most confident. This yeah. is what works for us. So we're just giving you our experiences. Yeah. Repeat, 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 repeat. Okay, here we go. So now we're going to go back into our sort of podcast here and then after we talk about the art side we'll do questions again and then we'll talk about the business side so let's have fun first art side so <laughs> what let's have fun welcome first. to the art i know we side. have 74 viewers let's have fun <laughs> don't scare them away um the two things that we're going to talk about are products and presentation so products you would think is a little more obvious when you think of a product what do you think you're going to sell as an artist first thing a drawing? Prints. Okay. And, well, I guess originals, maybe. <laughs> but I, like, uh, I love selling my originals. Prints. And I was talking, actually, I was talking to Peter Morbacher yesterday, and he said there's three types of products that people buy at cons. It's wall art, collections, and lifestyle items. So if you sell, like, rings or necklaces or play mats or bath mats, whatever it might be, that's a lifestyle item. If you're selling books or some somehow it's a collection of work, and that's a mm -hmm. collection. And then if you're selling wall art, obviously it's something that you'd put on the wall, a print. And those are the three. And it kind of varies. I agree with it for the most part, but what ones are important to you, this is where it gets very subjective. But prints may be the obvious one. But what you're not thinking about is, or what you're thinking is, okay, I can make a print. I can go to Office Max and make a print for like a dollar. Mm -hmm. But what you're not taking into account about, okay, well, let's dig a little deeper. That might be the surface level thought, but now what size are we going to print at? 8.5 by 11, 13 by 19, 11 by 17, whatever it might be. What's the paper type? Is it going to be shiny? Is it going to be luster? Is it going to be glossy? There are so many. Matte, premium pro matte. I, I feel like I could list a bunch just on the free paper that we've gotten yeah, over the years. Luster. And the, what's the weight of the paper? And the, I mean, that's if you're going a little more fancy. Are you going to have a border on your prints? Are you going to have like a little white border? Or are you going to have it borderless? This all might sound overwhelming, Because it the is. Way. Wait, hold on. There's okay, more. Right. Are you going to sign them? What's the price are you going to sell them as a prints? Are you going to put them in slip cases, the little plastic cases that you put in them? Well, if you do that, are you going to have cardboard backing? And if you have cardboard backing, are you also going to slip in a business card? So those are some things that... Everyone with anxiety, their head just exploded <laughs> right now. I'm just letting you know. Like I said, this all might be overwhelming. So 
Take what you want out of these. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to help you anxiety folk out there because holy crap. And then I'm gonna help you guys that are extra out there <laughs> like me that want to go a little extra mile on everything. But you're probably gonna fail more if you're like me and go the extra mile and everything. There's gonna be a lot of times that you're gonna waste a lot of money and that you're gonna fail. So be aware of that. Now that could be also said about pins and books and your originals. You have to think about the presentation of the product. And not only that, when you look at all of your pieces combined, like for me, my stuff's all grayscale. So if I had a booth that was just gray, I didn't have any accents colors. If I didn't have gold, I think my booth would look a little mundane. Mm. Same like if someone had a lot of color work, let's say their color was primarily blue. If their backdrop in their tablecloth was like a dark blue, it probably would look kind of strange. Instead of like accenting it, it's just kind of melting into the prints. But what if you had like, what's a good, like a sandy color tablecloth and backdrop and then all your prints were mainly blue, it might be a nice compliment. Mm -hmm. Where if it was blue on blue, it might be hard to tell where the print ends and where the yeah. tablecloth begins. So keep that in mind. Look at, I honestly would spread all your art out because I assume most of you have color stuff. Yes. Spread it out and try to create a palette from your pieces. Color harmony. And then pick an accent color to act as your like booth setup. Yeah. Color harmony. And something that Pui always sell, uh, tells us, and I, I do agree with him. I think it's proven itself over the years. You are selling an experience. You are not just selling your art. You're selling yourself. You're selling the time that they have in front of your booth. Yes. I think it's important to... Instead, well, it's more like instead of it, be personable, be, be excited about your work. You know, even if you're having a bad day, like put that all away. Every all of that's got to go away and everything like that yeah. because you're talking to people that you don't know. It's like when you meet somebody for the first time, you don't walk up to them and be like, and you and you be like, oh, get out of here. You know, <laughs> you don't, nobody does that. And if you do, I'm sorry, but you should learn not to. But yeah, it's it's all about. You are technically being a salesman, but you are basically selling yourself, sell an experience that they have, sell you as a person rather than you and your artwork. Yeah. Like, like your artwork. And I find that if you are just genuine with who you are as a person to your day to day kind of people, but put on your best foot forward, people will respond to that because they kind of respect when they feel respected. And that's something that we've seen when an artist treats people kind of poorly, mm -hmm. they, they kind of garner a bad reputation and that does spread. It's true. It really is. I mean, word of mouth, especially with, especially at conventions because there's so many people mm -hmm. and there's so many people interacting with people that they could literally like, so let's say you were having a bad day and you showed it and someone bought a print off of you and then uh, they go and they show somebody and one of their friends walked by who you didn't know that they were with and they're like, oh, I bought this print from somebody and then that guy comes back and he's like, ah, oh, that guy was a butt. I didn't like him. Yeah. And then, so instantly in that, that, in that head, they're like, ah, oh, those guys are butts. That happens a lot, actually. And the opposite is true. We met a friend, Carrie, last year. And then this, we had a really good experience with Carrie. Now she's one of our close friends. And then this year, I swear, there were like eight people that were like, oh, you're the person Carrie talks about. Your mm -hmm. art's in her room. Yeah. And then they also bought for me. So if you have a good experience with someone, that can also spread. It's like, what's that movie with uh, what's the one Haley thing? Joel Osment? Pay it forward. You have a good experience with one person that oh, can yeah. spread to three. <laughs> oh, yeah. But if you have a bad experience with a person that can spread to three as well. So be aware and just treat people with respect. It's very simple. I think it's very simple, what, but yeah, a lot of people what, seem what's to struggle what Marcus Lamona says? His very first rule, right? Uh, his very first rule is just be nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about people, product, and... No, not that stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, not that I, stuff. That's, that's coming that's up. Okay I was like, watch wrote, the profit. Yeah. I'm serious. <laughs> it's okay if you wrote that. But... We don't know who Marcus Lamona says. He's one of my heroes, so we'll get into that in the business side of things. To being, like, being a salesman or anything like that or selling your artwork, like, people just, I mean, people just want an experience. People just want to be respected. People just want to just, I, just feel nice throughout the day. So just be nice to the person, you know? Yeah. And before we get into presentation, though, I guess we should talk about product. I didn't make many, many notes for it, but I think it's obvious that your product should be to the highest quality that you can make it. And obviously, cost is definitely a factor where I think Sean and I and everyone in the house, we can spend a little more to have nicer paper, thicker paper, or even like the G clay paper that Pui buys. But am oh I, do I recommend that for those starting off? No, I don't think it's worth it especially if I was telling myself this four years ago to buy paper that was 50 cents more per page just because it had a nicer feel and touch. Mm -hmm. 
to be honest, that is not within my financial realm four years ago. Got, to real, even... got real bougie paper over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does get a little bougie later on, but it becomes fun because then it's like you level up. Kind of like in a video game, you level up your armor. In the con life, you would level up your prints. You'd level up your presentation. You'd level up your paper. You'd level up your paper. <laughs> Absolutely. I definitely think it's that. It's true. You should, you should grow. You should grow with your presentation. Yeah. And that's why I... Don't think paper is a big of a concern when you're starting off. I think it's good not to have like super flimsy paper. Yeah, you don't I, want noodle. It drives paper. me crazy. Noodle paper is kind of, and it's uh, easily to, or it's easy to destroy and bent. I bought one from someone at Minneapolis last year. I thought she had great art. It was a pig one that I bought, the mm-hmm. really cool one. And like, instantly, as soon as I put it in my folder it like bent on itself, and I was like, mm-hmm. "You got to be kidding me!" And I went over and I was like, "Hey, I love your." I love your work, but I think if you just had a little heavier stock paper, yeah. you could avoid this problem. And she was like, I know, blah, blah. And uh, she said for the next, so this year she said she would upgrade her paper. I think, uh, in my opinion, I always think cardstock is a good one to start mm-hmm. out with. Yes. Yep. Just matte cardstock. I wouldn't go any lighter than cardstock. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of actual printing it, we used to use a print house. Well, actually, there's a few that we could talk about. We used to use a, an actual brick and mortar print house called Remkey in Illinois. And he was great. He worked with us. He cut our paper for us, which a lot of print places do not do. And we had a really good relationship with him. But it was all glossy. They didn't do matte paper, so ones that didn't have a sheen on it. And we'd have to pick them up. He would ship them, but then there's an extra cost of shipping, which could be very pricey. And I think that's why we moved more towards self-printing. But I also do not recommend that from the get-go. We did that with Sean just because we were kind of carrying him under our wing and we didn't. We wanted him to skip a few of these initial steps, and maybe you guys want to jump into self printing and skip a few steps. But that's not oh, to wait, say it's with the, the self printing. Yeah, thing? but I don't want to oh, give the impression I, that it's better or worse. That was like a goal of mine. I was just like, I want to do this. <laughs> like, I want to print. With I still guys. know a lot of artists that get their prints ordered and they turn out fantastic. Like artists like James Jean, he's not printing in his basement. Maybe he is. Mm. But I doubt that he is. <laughs> he's using a print house. Could you imagine? Yeah, maybe right. he is. Maybe, maybe he's he is. one of those two thousand. There's no way printers. though, because he gets a special. Who he's got a two thousand dollar printer? I don't know. We're Pui and I are kind of nuts though. Well, Pui is even more crazy than I am. But anyways, I'm not trying to give the impression that one's better than the other. But when you order prints online, there's a very good chance that they may come back darker, miscolored, uh, miscut. Some kind of a misprint that may happen because you're ordering online, and there's nothing you can really do about that. Where self-printing, if you recognize that there's an error, you can stop the print right away. You don't mm-hmm. have to waste a bunch of paper and ink. Yes. That's, but the big con with it is there's a lot of frustration that comes with self-printing. And I think we're becoming more and more aware of that. But it's worth it still for us to do self-printing because we like, I think, the control. We like yeah. adjusting on the fly. And then if there's a print that we make that week, we can print it off and then have it ready tomorrow for a con that we drive to. I feel like everyone in this house is kind of a control freak. So. Except for Tyler. He's not here. So <laughs> Sean's like, can I say things? No, Tyler still orders. No, I'm not going to. So I guess a good example, Tyler still orders his prints, and they look great. Yeah. And he gets them in a box, and he gets them like a week before the con, then he packages them himself, and he's good to go. He doesn't have a need for self-printing. Or same with Ashley and Gabe. They didn't have a need for self-printing. No. They would print it at uh, a house. They would and have they it delivered. they still look great. And they still look great. They still look great to this day. So it, it kind of depends. Are you nitpicky like Sean, myself, and Key or Pui, where you want that control? You want that, what would that be called? Control. Neurotic? Neurotic. Attention to detail? And I mean, you just be neurotic about how things look. So yeah. Yeah. I guess. And so there's definitely pros and cons. I would say try to figure out what kind of artist you are, or if you even want to do printing yourself, there's a lot of pain that comes with it. So I don't. I don't want to be like, oh, it's so much better ever since I went to printing at home. I enjoy it more, but definitely comes with its costs. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about with products, what was the other things I want to talk about? Quality. I guess what type of products. Don't have a barrage of like a bunch of different products. I've seen a lot of booths that will have like prints and keychains and enamel <clears throat> pins and... Uh, patches and uh, little rings or jewelry. They're like the goal for everything. Mm-hmm. I think it's better to have a consistent stock of a few things. I, think, I wouldn't have more than like three. I think if you are going to like, let's say if you do something to where you have prints, patches, 
and pins. You know, maybe just you have something like that and everything. Yeah. Um, stuff like that, I think your main focus, like like whatever you want your main focus to be, that's what your booth should encapsulate. And then there should be little tiny little things, mm-hmm. like little displays and stuff like that. Don't put all your focus on being like, okay, like people need to see these, people need to see these, people need to see these. Yeah. Pick a focus on what you want to showcase uh, for your artwork. Um, put like the best type of like the presentation that you can in that. And then the other one should work around that. Yes. Because it can look very cluttered very fast when you have a bunch of products. And if you get a little confused remembering all your products, yeah. imagine being a viewer at your booth. One thing too is when you make your booth, all, uh, boot, boot, boot. When, when you, you make, make your booth. When you make your booth. Um, no, when you make your booth, um, always take a picture of it right after you're done so you can have a memory of it yep. or like so you can have a picture of it and then you can look at it and after the convention you can improve upon it. Yes. What do you got? What do you got here? I don't know if I should type this. Or just... I like that purple. That's a good purple. I like purple. I got my purple hoodie on. Right? So I think that's the main thing with the art side of the products and then just be aware of the size that you're going at. This I know we talked about this earlier, but we think okay, uh, what are those called? The quick buys, impulse buys. Impulse buys, yeah. That's what my buttons were, and I Dry thought that buy. was the right. way to make money. It definitely will get you a lot of sales, but let's put this in perspective. If I sell, let's say, twelve buttons and they're five dollars for three, that means I just made twenty dollars. But I had to have four different customers come to my booth. They had to look through all the buttons, and then remember, there were 77 of them, mm-hmm. and they had to look through all of them to figure out which ones they wanted, and then they finally made their purchase. So that's a lot of time that's invested, too. Meanwhile, Pui sells his prints right now, I think, for 40 a pop, and he just sells one after having a two-minute conversation with someone about what the print <laughs> is, and he just made $40. So in the half hour that I spent talking with three mm-hmm. people and learning about their interests and what buttons that they're picking and they're choosing, I made $20, and I'm selling more quantity but he's selling quality, so he's making more money. And his profit margin is way bigger than mine, so he's making more actual net profit than I am, not just gross. And we'll talk about what that those both mean on the business side, but basically mm-hmm. he's making more money than me just on the products that he's selling because it's just essentially a piece of paper with ink on it that costs him about $1.15, where all these buttons collectively would cost me about 3 to $4, and he's making $40, I'm making 20 and like we've mentioned before, people will mostly buy, I just want to say 90% of people will probably go to your booth and buy whatever the cheapest product is. Mm-hmm. And there is a good chance that you'll get what, uh, it's kind of, I don't know if this is insulting, but a lot of people say at conventions, you'll find what are called whales. And that's people that have a lot of money. I People have called me a whale before when I go to cons, where you don't go for the smaller tier item, you go for the larger tier items. Mm-hmm. But the, Thank you, base animation. The difference between whales and people that just want something to remember you by, way different. There are way more people that just want something small, and if you offer a $5 product versus a 15 if it's somewhat similar, yeah. they're going to buy the $5. Why? Mm-hmm. There's no need for them to spend in 10 your, more dollars. In your opinion, I want to know what your opinion is. is yeah. What should be your lowest price number Like, like out of your whole booth? Because mine's $10. I think that's a good one. Yeah. I mean, the lowest I have is 15 and even I'm trying to cut that out. Uh, I, you know, it'd be funny. This is such a perspective thing. Cause I'm sure Pui would say 30, but in my mind, I would think 15 where you would think 10. And I think it's just cause we're basing it on yeah, our own booth. Probably on our own experience. And I think too. as you get, or as you do more cons, you kind of slowly filter out smaller stuff, but maybe you're the type of artist that really likes selling small things and you want to be able to sell to people that can afford. I guess it's, I guess it's weird because I like I do like selling postcards, but I sell those postcards for a set. Yeah, I sell I sell them as a set. Yeah, yeah, three dollars or not three dollars, three for twenty. Yeah, there you go. So I think that will come. Are you gonna talk about deals or is that gonna be on the business side? Business side. Gotcha. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, just you wait. Okay. Okay, right, let's move on to the second start. The second half of the art side. So, presentation is key. Presentation. Sean, can you talk about that for a second? Presentation. 
Presentation is key. It's how people, when they walk up, and it's what people see right away and everything like that. You look at it as a whole, and people see, wow, this is really great. I want to walk right up to this booth and see it. Because there are going to be people, so that you have people like at conventions to where they walk by, and you have people who walk like right by the table. What's going on? You have people who walk right by the table, and they're like, oh, wow, this is great. But then, most likely, you have people who are like all the way back here, and they're all like, and they're just like looking. Yeah. And they'll just like stare at your booth and they'll look at it as a whole. You're right. Um, I got to pee really yeah, quick. Yeah, go for it. Um, so when it comes to presenting your things, you want to make sure that everything is clear. You want to make sure that there is like an actual focus on what you want to show. So kind of like what we talked about when it came to prints, uh, patches or pins or anything like that. Um, and one thing too, as well, when it comes to presentation is imagine how you would actually want your artwork to be seen. Uh, I had a thing to where I did a gallery show last year. Uh, mind you, this isn't a convention, but this is, this is just kind of a thing that in my head. Um, I did a gallery show last year and I sent, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a secret. I sent, uh, that in, I, I sent it in, but I bought a frame. I bought a very, very cheap frame and I put it in the frame and I sent it off to the gallery and I was like, this is going to be great. It's in a frame. It's going to look great. It's, no, I went there and it looked like it looked like garbage compared to everybody else's and how they presented it. I, it literally was there. It looked washed out. It just looked like it was, it was kind of like tacked on. It was gross. It was very gross. Um, so with presenting your work, presentation is key for anything, honestly, when it comes to, I mean, art, music, anything like that. Um, so yeah, so make sure that you have this just a consistent look. And that's where one thing where we talked about is taking a picture, taking a picture of uh, your booth after every mm -hmm. convention that you do. You can see where the weak parts of your booth are as compared to the stronger parts of your booth that are. Um, and just knowing what is the most consistent thing that you can keep up on when it comes to your booth. Yeah. I told I told him about the uh, <laughs> what was it uh, the light gray art lab thing. It wasn't it wasn't oh. a yeah. It, I mean it's not a convention, but I was still presenting my work, and it looked like crap. And I'm still sad about it to this day. But I'm so glad you did that because now when you do it again, yeah, no, you gotta you keep know. failing, gotta fail keep a failing. bunch. I hope you guys fail so much. <laughs> uh, the mm. the things that. One thing too, and, and another thing for the new people that came in is just remember that your booth is always ever like your booth is always ever growing. Um, you're not gonna have like this, like this consistent, you know, yes. look and everything of this booth uh, because you're gonna be creating more work. You're gonna be trying different products and everything like that. Um, but there should still be an idea of knowing um, what you want your booth to kind of look like and a theme that you kind of want to go with. I think that's how you spell consistency. So the next thing, yeah. oh, and for those who are just joining, also I guess we should say we're doing a stream just about conventions. So if this mm -hmm. is something that interests you, stay tuned. We're on the art side. We're going to get to the business side in just a second. So with presentation, consistency is huge. If you have a theme, kind of like we just talked about with the color palette, mm -hmm. really go for it. Don't just like, just ah, I'm going to dabble yeah. with Here's the white theme. And gold. Mine's red. Red and white. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it complements the work. Blue. And you have to look at your work as a part of that presentation. Because you could have a really, like, imagine my booth if it was the white and gold. But then all of my prints were, like, metallic reflective silver with <laughs> magenta outlining. Oh, cannoli. It would look so contrasted and, in my, in my personal opinion, terrible. And I think you have to look at your booth as a whole. And does it work all together? And there's going to be always things that you can nitpick and add to, and that's good. That means that your booth is evolving and your taste is getting better, and you can kind of see, okay, this worked for me on the last show. I'm going to add this and see if it works at this show. Mm -hmm. And yes, I put that your presentation should reflect your art. So if I'm trying to go for more of a high fantasy look to my stuff, I want the booth to not distract from it. So if I had like a really gaudy Christmas tablecloth and then i tried to present my stuff as a high fantasy it would look distraught <laughs> it would look very contrasted so definitely try to heighten your art as much as you can because you want to you want to love your art as much as you want other people to and if you present it in mm -hmm. a good light then people are going to see it in a good light if you present it in kind of a makeshift awful way that's how people are going to read it imagine yourself imagine your pull yourself away pull your ego away as yep. much as you can 
um, and imagine yourself as a viewer of your own artwork. How do you want to see it? What do you imagine your artwork being displayed like? See it objectively. Imagine mm -hmm. it's someone else's booth. It becomes easier to critique it then. The other things that I wrote down was don't clutter it so it's easy to navigate for the viewer. My booth at Amkey, if I was honest, was too cluttered. I had too many prints and it was because I was trying to fill an exhibitor booth, but it was very easy for me to objectively see that there was too much. There was too much for someone to choose from. And a lot of people say more is better, but I think with cons and with booths, I actually would say, I don't want to say less is better because it's that medium. It's having a good point where there's just enough where it feels like... Sweet spot. It's Yeah, there's a sweet spot where there's just enough mm -hmm. where it feels like you have a lot of product and uh, you're presenting it well, but you don't have so much where it's hard to decide what you want. Mm -hmm. And then you might have a lot of people... I've had, I don't know if you get this, but definitely at Emke, you'd just be like, oh, I just can't decide. There's too much. And I've had, I've lost sales, I think, because of that. I don't have a lot of dis things displaying hanging, which is one thing that's where true. I kind of feel like I'm kind of lacking in. I have everything on my table. And that's a good thing to also recognize is, oh yeah, let's talk about that really quick. Should you display your stuff on uh, a wall or should it be on your table? We used to get the, or do you build an art cave and have yourself like inside of it? Key does that and I do that as well. And then Pui puts his art behind him and has stuff on the table oh, yeah. with some stuff in front of him. So what is the best way to go about doing it? Nobody Subjective. knows. Yeah, nobody but knows. There is some things that we have noticed. So at least let's just talk from our own experiences yeah. and not talk for other people like Pui because he has his stuff behind him and in front, but nothing higher than like, he can always, he can with. always, you can always see his you face. You can always see his face. And that's mm -hmm. very important for Pui because he talks a lot. He tries to sell people on his work and it, mm -hmm. it works. But for me, when I'm, oh, you know what? Really quick, before we even talk about that, sitting versus standing at a show. Mm. Oh man. You know, am I jumping the gun? I feel like we could have a whole off suit it's, on. Yeah. How, you go back to yeah, what you were talking to, okay. about. Yeah. Yeah. Displaying so, your artwork. If you have your stuff on a wall. If people are walking past your booth, let's imagine that there were three people in front of your booth talking with you. They become a barricade, essentially. And if you have your stuff, like Sean was saying, just on your table, the people walking behind them, they can't see it they can't see at it. all. And I think that's why you see these towers of prints at cons all the time mm -hmm. is because if there are people in front of your booth, people still need to be able to see your art. So mm -hmm. having it higher than heads. So like six foot, anything higher than six foot is like average for viewing point. Yeah. And I would recommend putting it on a wall because even Pui, even though he puts it behind him, they're higher up. So height is definitely a big thing to include with your booth. And I think mm -hmm. it's something that Sean will adapt into it now that he's, I feel like, it, I feel like it's been actually growing more like, it like it is, uh, to where like the height's been actually, I, I used to be like really like apprehensive Low. about it. And I was like, Oh, I don't know if this is too high. <laughs> And everything, oh, can people see it? But now I'm just like, just get it up there so people can see it from behind. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that I know that people, I've always noticed people looking at the table. I notice people when they walk by, they always go like this. Yes. Is there's always looking and they're just kind of scanning each table this as is they the table. go by. Yeah. And they're yeah. just like, oh, cool, great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like what it is. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but then if you have stuff, so imagine this is the table. So, Sean, put. There's a big difference between the print being like this yes. and the print being like, being like this. That I know both of us do that, and I, I know Pui and Ki does that. If you lay your prints flat, that might be great if someone comes up to your booth, but to attract someone to your booth, you want it to be able to be seen from like 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. And if it's laying flat on the booth, they won't even know that it's there. Yeah. Something to keep in mind. The only thing that I have laying flat on my booths are just like multiple ones, so I have it displaying out like this so let's say if, if i had this print the it'd be like this this would display it but then i would have extra ones just laying mm -hmm. underneath it just so people can just take those and then wait, wait one more thing so then hold yours here okay so a lot of people will do this if this is the booth they'll have one print go higher yep right there so then they'll do like a double stack and yeah. then if they are standing behind it it should look like this where you can still see the person's head they can talk mm -hmm. above it but you don't want to get drowned out in your art. So oftentimes what you see is a little more of a tilt and it's more like this. I definitely think there still should at least be some negative space, like some open space. Just so it's not super cluttered. Like you don't have that yeah. cluttered feel. You yeah. Know? That's definitely something that you'll kind of figure out my opinion. doing more of these cons. But we've noticed that having 
higher walls, not too high, and not cluttering it definitely works very well. Uh, so going back into what I was going to jump into earlier, your the way that you present yourself is so important. Mm -hmm. I wish I could talk to artists more about this that don't seem to be doing well at conventions because if someone is behind their booth and they are just like disinterested, yeah, be be someone here. This is your sketchbook. Yeah. Imagine, here, wait, go a little higher so they can see you. <laughs> so this, honestly, we see this all the times at conventions where someone will have a head down, sometimes a hood up, and they're drawing in a sketchbook. And then, and then like, when people come to their booth, they're like this. Yeah, and you might think, well, they're an artist. They should be working, sorry, and that Elba. shows that. Sorry, all those people. I'm not sorry. I want them to hear what that looks like. To me, that just shows through. I'm not interested in you, you at all. Anyone that comes to my booth and has interest in my art, I don't care. I'm more focused on doing me right now that I don't want to even acknowledge you uh, coming up to my art. It, it's very rude. In my opinion, it's very rude. No, no, I agree with you. It, it, it's rude. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily think drawing at your booth is rude. I've seen a lot of artists do that. And sometimes they take on-site commissions. That's great because I still see artists that are drawing. They'll look up and be like, "Hi, how's it going? Ask me. Let me know if you have any questions." Mm -hmm. That's There's different. There's still acknowledgement. There's still acknowledgement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the rude people are the ones that just like look up and just could not care less. And especially if someone's buying from them and they like take the money quick and like hand them a print, and that's it. I just. I wish they could see how bad that looks well, and their just, reputation well, just, just gets Well, just imagine tarnished. you as a buyer. So you come up and you're interested in their work and you like them and this person is just like not talking, not really looking at you or anything yeah. like that. It's kind of one of those things to where like even just as a human, like you don't want to interrupt them. Kind yes. Of, you know, yeah. like, like you see them and you're just like, I, they might be busy. Okay, I, I'll go away and then maybe they'll be not be busy. Yeah. You know, so yeah, just don't be an ass. <laughs> and not only that i think it's really I, this sounds kind of gross but i definitely know that there's prejudice on uh people that come up to your booth and whether or not you think they will buy from you and well thank you geeky 33333 for following that should never be a factor on treating people with respect outside of even conventions mm -hmm. i have talked to artists that will complain about like 13 year olds coming up to their booth and literally i always i'm so glad this happened at ohio con this year i had an i had a 13 year old drop 70 dollars at my booth oh yeah never judge how much money or income you think that person has based on the way they dress or their age Oh, oh, thank you, Spongy, hey, Spongy. for subscribing. Oh, I, where did we get hearts from? I don't know. How, how did that happen? I didn't program that. Whoa! <laughs> that good. Oh, that's great. I don't know how that happened. Thanks, I have magic. Spongy. Uh, thank you, Spongy. You get... Hold on. Let me give you some fridges yeah, before we continue here. Fridges. Chat. And I think it's something good for you guys to note, too. If, gosh, if you are racist or prejudiced, I would just avoid doing conventions because that reputation will destroy you in the long run. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I just like just, just how you said that. Like, if you're racist or prejudiced, just don't go to cons. Don't go to cons. Yeah. Because I would, it, people are watching. Oh my God. Never mind. What? I was just thinking of just racist people watching. Our, oh, yeah. They're like, watch to thing. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't go. I think it's. Something that should be common sense, but you still see some disrespect happening at conventions, even though it's like a safe place and it's art. I mean, for the most part, everyone's wonderful, but there's always a few that you're like, mm -hmm. I wish you wouldn't do that, or I wish you wouldn't look at that person in that way. Okay, I think... Oh, no, the last thing I wrote on here, stand out. That doesn't mean in a bad way. That doesn't mean like, oh, that person's booth, like... It's a train wreck. You should go check it out. Unless if that's like your theme, then oh own it. <laughs> but when I'm saying stand out, I mean... Oh my. That's the ad before oh, before our stream. That's cute. <laughs> uh, I, I think for the longest time, I didn't have a traditional graphite booth is because I thought I had to create color fan art. And I thought that that was the way that you had to go about doing conventions to make money. It wasn't until I started doing my traditional original fully and completely for a booth that I really started to make more money. And I'm not talking just like a little more. It almost doubled at the first con just because I wiped out my fan art and I really embraced the traditional booth. I went with the white and gold and I, I, I went for it. 
knowing that there was a good chance that it could have failed. But like I'm saying to you guys, I want you to fail a lot. And that risk that I took really paid off and it's paying off to this day. And I want you guys to recognize how important taking risk can be and not just following the trend or the, what would that be called? Not just following the trend. No, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. Following the crowd? Kind of. Ah, I'll think of it later. What, I'm was, sure. what was the what was the base of this? Of standing out and how it's good to take risks of not just doing what everyone else is doing. The status quo. There we go. You're not just following the status quo of like looking at other booths, okay. seeing what they do, copy and repeat it for your own booth, and thinking that you'll make a lot of money because essentially you're just a copy clone of a different booth. So you got to really stand out. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the business side. I don't want to lose a lot of you guys. I think this is wait, super wait, wait, important. Wait, wait, wait. We should ask. Oh yeah, Matt. let's answer questions, answer questions first. Sorry, and thank you again, Spongy. You're great. Oh, hey, Sean, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> what are you doing? Thank no, you, Art of Prize. Not paying attention. <laughs> Come on now. Oh, where were we? Uh, Faith says, "Is it terrible that I'm excited for bu- oh, I didn't the even business make it side?" The cup. Good. <laughs> uh. No, I think that's great that you're excited for the business side. I'm excited for it too. I think I'm one of the few people in our crew that actually enjoys the business side besides that's true, yeah. Uh Maria says, I had such a great time talking to the people who came up to my booth. One girl even commented on my Instagram that she got back into art because of talking to me at Amkey. It was pretty cool. So yeah, the experience at cons are worth the price too. 100%. 100%. I'm so glad that you had that experience at the first one. Jopo says, quick little question. I could have missed it. Have you announced the winner of the 60K giveaway at the Care Night? Yes, it was number 394, but I have to do a post on who won it. I'll probably do that to, uh, tomorrow. I've just been a little overwhelmed with we've had people at the house since Thursday and obviously the convention. So there's been a lot in my Patreon launching. So I'll definitely get to that. And I have to also create a 65K giveaway. Uh, Cactus says, the buttons were mostly fan art. They were pretty much all fan art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't do original buttons. Do, do, do. Adrian says, have you guys hung out with other artists who just attended the con and don't have booth? Yeah. Yeah. At Ohio con, we hung out with Koi. If you don't know who Koi Kun is, he is a very good 18 plus artist, but Spongy also came and visit us. Might and Spongy came, came to visit us. Actually. Yeah. So honestly, we the will hang out with also came and visited us. If you guys come say hi to us at a con, there's a good chance that we'll have good conversation and possibly even get dinner or something. Mm-hmm. So, Keep that in mind. This tea is too sweet. It says, I have a really bad anxiety about showing myself or my face. Would it be really weird to wear a costume or mask and still be fairly active with the customer? I mean, I'm fine with talking a lot and interacting, but I feel like I would end up hiding halfway through the con if I was there by myself. In my opinion, I would not wear a mask. Why, thank you, Scarlet Fox Studios, for following. I would think, I mean, if you're going to, like, cosplay, like, behind your booth, then if that makes you feel more comfortable, then yes. But I wouldn't say wear a mask. Yeah, like, our roommate Ashley, she wears a giant, or, like, a big elf Mm -hmm. outfit, and she, like, embraces that fully. Mm -hmm. So if you want to embody a character to make you you feel more comfortable, go for it. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're behind a booth, being able to see the person's eyes and have a, like, human-to-human connection is good. I know you probably won't believe it, but I grew up a very much like a shy kid. I was very just to myself. I didn't talk much. Thanks for the follow, Scarlett. And it didn't, it wasn't until college that I really like embraced interacting with other people and other artists. And when you're at cons, you'll learn quickly that the people that go to these shows are kind of equally weird and introverted. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to feel like you're the awkward one. Oftentimes you'll feel they're the awkward ones and you have to try to make them feel comfortable. And the more that you do these shows, I, I just feel like you gain a better sense of talking and how to interact with people and how to read signs of where the conversation's going, leading it, yeah. being able to make them laugh, throwing in jokes. It's just like understanding just, I mean, it starts to turn into just like you, you start to notice like behavioral things that they do or just you'll just notice this, this social interaction. Like you'll notice somebody, this, this actually goes into Jim's question right underneath it. Um, to where, like, if somebody who's very shy and they come up to your booth and everything like that, you don't want to, like, bombard them and be like, hey, how's it going? What do you do? Where's your life? Let's talk about oh, it yeah. and everything like that. 
be respectful. If if you know that they don't want to talk and everything, that acknowledge them, say hi. If they have any questions, you know, like say hey, be like, hey, don't be afraid to ask any questions if you have anything like that. And most of the time, they'll be fine and comfortable. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. And a little bit of acknowledgement goes a really long way. And if you are someone that describes themselves as being shy or you have anxiety about showing yourself, I think this would be a good challenge for you to Absolutely. try to overcome. Absolutely. And just imagine us in your head just giving you that encouragement and being like, you can do this. Oh, thank you, Spongy. Thanks, Spongy. Ah, oh, you're too kind right now. <laughs> Aw, I really appreciate that. Uh, okay, and then what was the second half? To be honest, I actually like when there's only one person behind the booth compared to two. I think it's easier for customers to feel comfortable coming up to a booth with one person yeah. versus two. Two can be a little overwhelming for some people, especially the people who do have a little bit more social anxiety and everything mm-hmm. like that. I think just them being at the con is already overwhelming enough. And so it's like, yeah, you know, so it's like, imagine it like when we go, like if you're shy and you have to go order coffee for like your friend and everything that like you don't particularly want coffee, yeah. but your friend's like, hey, can you go get coffee for me? And you got to go up and talk to these people and you're like, oh no, I'm going to die, you know? But <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, it's just kind of imagine, put yourself in their shoes for a second, you know? So definitely like one person behind a booth, I think is just a little bit more comforting. Yeah. Uh, so now I got these questions, and we got to get to the business side. Spongy says, do you think fan art is beneficial or hurtful to the sales of your original art? There's a lot of debate on this. I've heard a lot of people say fan art will bring and draw people in because mm-hmm. it's recognizable, and then they may stay for the original. But the yeah. key word in that sentence is may. If someone sees Pikachu at your booth and they want to buy Pikachu, they're probably not interested in they your original art. They're going to get Pikachu. They're going to get Pikachu. Plus, if they buy from you, sometimes there's this weird stigma. If you buy from someone, you feel like you completed that booth. You can't buy anything more from this booth because you already bought something from them. Yes. So then they'll move on to another booth. So the way that I see fan art mixing with original is if you give them the both options, just like Sean was saying earlier with a higher price versus lower price mm-hmm. tier, there's a good chance they're going to lean toward the fan art. And they'll probably get the fan art because it's recognizable. It's something that they relate with. Uh, if you're going to go the original route, I would definitely either go at it from the beginning or have like a half and half booth where you slowly take out fan art. And mind you, this is if your end goal is to do original. The way that I've seen it work the most, especially Sean was a great example of someone that got brought in, avoided the fan art route altogether and just went pure original. And it worked pretty well from um, pretty much right from the start where you had people like me or Tyler or Gabe, like other people that we know that started kind of in fan art and it was a little bit of a struggle to get out of it. And then once you finally did, you kind of saw the benefits of it. So it depends on what art style you have, depends on how much uh, quality is within your work. And if you do fan art, try to stand art, stand out as a fan artist, but that's hard to do because there's do so art, much competition. Try stand art. So, <laughs> think about it. Because if you do Pikachu, guess what? There's probably 10 to 20 other artists that do Pikachu. Other Pikachu. What is so much better about your Pikachu versus their Pikachu? Make your fan art original. So then, oh, that's a good way to say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. And it's the difference of if I draw like my character red, there isn't going to be another red out there, I would hope. And <laughs> I don't have competition in that realm. But it becomes harder for me because people don't recognize it right away. There's no instant relatability where if they recognize Pikachu instant. So there's definitely pros and cons to each. I don't think I I don't want to crucify one or the other because I think each have their benefits and their negatives, but I think as a artist that has gone through both, I've definitely seen original being way more beneficial and when I sold an original versus a fan art, the feeling was tenfold. So something to keep in mind. Okay, to do digital uh, Jim says, can we talk about what you as the artist is thinking when you're all alone and unoccupied and a shy, curious person comes up and just wants to look at the art, which they might not really enjoy, but they are curious nonetheless. Do you feel the need to talk to them? Or are you better at letting them talk first? This is where you get a read. <clears throat> if you can kind of see that the person doesn't want to talk and they just want to kind of look, let them be. It's all based off. I, I always think it's all based off the high. You should at least say hi. And then it's all based off on how they say hi back. And everything like that. If they're excited, if they're like, hi, you know, like then you read them and you're like, okay, maybe I can go yeah. a little further. But if it's more of a quieter, like, hi, you know, type of thing, then it's like, okay, like you just say, if you have any questions, let me know. And then you let them do their thing. Yep. And oftentimes if someone takes a step toward your booth, that's where I'll start saying hello. Because usually people, when they come to cons, I feel like there's a three foot gap. 
There's a three foot gap in which people like look at your booth and try not, to decide if they want to come up that. to your booth. If they take that step within the three foot gap, that's when I'll start saying hi. I make a cheeky joke to get them closer. I always do. Don't doubt it. I always do, yeah. Don't doubt I say, it. It's not a museum bit. over here. You guys can get closer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's actually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Spongy says, I was so bashful. You guys were so good to me and so kind. It. I'm telling you, just being respectful of other people goes a long way. And I've see, I've not only met a few artists, or I've not only seen other artists do it, but I've met a few artists. I've gone to their booth, and they didn't know who I was, because who are we? And they were so disrespectful. And in my mind, the whole time, I was critiquing and being like, I cannot believe you're not even looking me in the eye when I'm asking you about your art. Mm-hmm. It was so disrespectful that I didn't, I didn't buy any art from them. And I'm not going to comment on it. I'm not going to make it make them feel bad about being disrespectful and i'm just gonna walk away i think to be honest if you ever are in that scenario where you feel disrespected just walk away don't let it get under your skin yeah tigel says i couldn't stop myself i bought an in custom embossed stamp machine thingy so now all my prints will have a logo embossed in them oh i want one so bad i'm thinking about getting one i want one too i know i want to talk to you maybe after tigel it's been a what is it? It's I so think, cool. I think we have that print of James, James Dean, Dean up there, it and the it's a peacock like embossed. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, this is nice. Oh, it's just bougie things. <laughs> Spongy says, "You guys are the best about breaking me out of my shell." Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, believe me, you were so nice and everything like that. It was great. Yeah. Okay. Now we got to go to the business side. It's a game, play to win. So. All right. Well. well you do this. I'm going to the bathroom. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John's like, even I want to leave at this part. <laughs> I love the business side of just everything. I'm a numbers guy. I was really good at math growing up. You might not think it because I'm into art, but I love knowing and crunching numbers. And with the business side, you need to know your numbers. Yeah, it's fun to go to conventions, but if you want to make a profit, you need to know your numbers. And honestly, the best way to learn it is while you're drawing, put on the show called The Profit in the background. It's by Marcus Lemonis, who's one of my like top three heroes. And he's not even an artist. He just helps failing businesses. And the way that he goes about it, it's not like a, what those nightmare chef kitchen shows where they're just yelling at the people all the time. Like Marcus gives good constructive feedback and really tries to help the business. And the things that he's taught in the show to these business owners, I've literally just adapted and soaked in like a sponge and I've just applied it to my con life. And I've shared it with my friends. And I feel like because of that, we've had uh, some more success with profit margins and gaining more of a profit. And honestly, just understanding the business side of things more where I think artists are a little lost. I'm, I'm putting myself in that box. I think we're more interested in drawing and creating where all of a sudden things that are more numbers or profit related, they're not as interesting. But since they it still interests me, I've kind of taken it upon myself for the crew to... Uh, really indulge in it and then uh, share out any information I learn. So the first, the biggest thing with the business side, and if you think like a business person, I always imagine putting on a different hat. You are putting on like the business side of you and your only goal is to be objective and to like make a profit. That should be the only goal if you're thinking on the business side of yourself, where the art side, yeah, it's to have fun. It's to make art that's true and represents where you want to be in the art world, blah, blah, blah. But on the business side, you want to make a profit. So the goal is to make a profit, but not only to make a profit, but to make it as big of a margin for a profit as you possibly can. It's going to put big. You can always think of it <laughs> like always Ooh. think, oh, big. Oh, b- <laughs> big. <laughs> that was yeah. unintentional. You can, always, uh, convenient you can always think of like what your profit cap is actually going to be and use that as a goal so it's like imagine if you sold out everything like you had this amount of prints and everything that imagine if you sold everything that's the amount of money that's the maximum amount of money that you can make at a con yeah if you want to use that as like if you want to use that as like a goal in any way if just already know yeah so i'm going to start off with an example because sometimes showing it is a lot easier than just saying it So what do I mean by making a profit? And for those of you who might not be familiar with terms, there's different types of profits. So there's like numbers on here. I know, right? Holy crap. Yeah, Sean's immediately like, I'm going to go to the bathroom again, actually. So what's the difference between a gross profit and a net profit? Gross profit is how much money you make at the show. A net profit is 
the money you make after minusing the expenses from your gross profit. So let's say I sell 10 books and they're 10 bucks a pop. That means I made a hundred bucks. But since each book costs, let's say $2 to make, that's $20. So I, my net profit is $80. So my gross profit is a hundred, but in reality, my actual profit, my net profit is $80. I know, I know. I'm bored. <laughs> This is why I do this for our crew, so they don't have to. <laughs> so here's an example that we're going to do with you guys. Actually, wait. I'm trying to scoot over. I'm going to move this. Do you want me to just... Here, I'll just... Here, no. Are we still on screen? There you nice. go. All right. Example. So let's say you're going to sell a book. Okay? The book cost... I think I put $5 to produce. Oops. And you're going to sell it for $20. $20. Okay. So if you sell a book, that means you made $15 in profit, correct? So what is your profit margin on this? I wasn't paying attention. What? This is, I failed math every <laughs> year of high school, middle school, elementary school. So your profit margin would be 75%. And the way that you do that is you do 15 divided by 20. So this is your actual profit, or this is the, yeah, this is your net profit, and this is the selling price. So this would be 75% <laughs> profit margin. Sketchio says, I'm like, teach us and <laughs> Oh my God, the number of viewership just it went, went up. up. Yeah, we should have been talking about profit <laughs> yeah, right? the whole time. Uh, math I love here. math. Okay, anyways. So what Marcus always talks about on the profit is if you can get this number here higher, your overall cost or your overall profit will go higher as well. So this is something that you want to focus on. Thank you, Torgan, for following. Thank you, Torgan. So a good example of this, so you might be wondering, well, how do I make my net profit higher? The obvious one would be to increase the selling price. But if you're looking on the back end of it, bulk is super important. So let's talk about the importance of bulk. If you order one book from a company, it'll be $5. If you order 100 books, let's say it's seven point, or it's 4.75. And let's see here. I'm going to keep going up. 450 and let's say it's a thousand it's four dollars so if you are able to afford a thousand books each book will only cost four dollars now let's do the math again really quick sean this shouldn't be that hard i, I believe in you here i haven't been paying attention to the beginning oh my god when numbers show up to me i'm sorry people i just want to let you know something real quick when numbers like are thrown at me or like money and everything like that. My brain, for some reason, instantly switches off. Why, thank you, yeah. Mira, that silence. Thank you, Mira. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate it. But yeah, so this is this is, this is is me, to where my brain is just kind of just like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. So Sean brings other aspects to the crew, like... Humor. Empathy. Yeah. Compassion. And then humor. I bring... Lots of humor. I bring kind of the math stuff and everything else, so... <laughs> <laughs> Even Angela says, Sean, I'm the same way with numbers. <laughs> so all of a sudden, if your profit was $16 over 20, guess what your profit margin just became? 80%. So you might be thinking, well, why is that a big jump if it's only 5%? Well, let me tell you. Let me erase all this really quick. Let me tell you. So tell me, Tim. That extra dollar would mean that, or let's say you sell 1,000 books, right? If you sell it at 75% profit margin, you're going to make, oh, well, wait, no, I wrote that down. Yes. Okay. So that means you would have an extra dollar for every book that you would sell. And if you have an extra dollar for every book, that means you would have an extra thousand dollars. So let's say that you applied it to more than just one product. Let's say you have 10 products where you do this same thing where you buy all in bulk. You have an extra $10,000. You have an extra $10,000. Now, obviously that's assuming you sell all of that product, but all of a sudden, just because you increased your profit margin from 75 to 80, just because you bought in bulk, 
that's where you get an extra $10,000. That's why you see big companies and why you hear people always say buy in bulk. How do you increase your profit margin? <laughs> I'm going to pretend you didn't just say no, that. No, I'm serious. <laughs> uh, when you buy in bulk, oftentimes you can order from like one to a hundred to 500 to a thousand. I always go for a thousand. And sometimes that there's a higher cap than that. But like for my last sketchbooks, I bought a thousand and it made the book cost cheaper. Gotcha. So when you make the cost of the goods cheaper, Thank oftentimes that means your profit margin will get larger. So that's one example of increasing your profits. Now there's a lot of different ways. So like, let's say you buy a certain type of paper, which we do. Oftentimes mm -hmm. there'll be deals that are thrown around Canon. And if you wait for those deals and then buy in bulk when that deal is like a really good one, you're saving a lot of money in the long run. Ooh, I didn't know this about Spongy, but she says, I like these math things. I have a degree in biomedical engineering, and I often <laughs> miss the classes. Well, that's this awesome. This really brings me back. So every, all you mathematicians out there, <laughs> all you engineers, everybody like that, welcome to the show. Yeah, and like to me, and I, me and Pui are the same way. We get excited trying to cut those costs because it's a game. It becomes Monopoly. Where we're not playing with real money. We're playing with this paper color money. And all of a sudden, Everybody's it gets really excited. Everybody's Park Place. Yeah. And Boardwalk. And honestly, it makes me feel good because then I can help my friends. And I feel like then not only am I benefiting myself, but I can benefit the people I actually care about in my life. Just because I have an interest in math and percentages and all that stuff. So it's definitely something to know. And uh, going out from there, I have expenses. Spongy said, this is an amazing way to incorporate math and arts. I agree. I totally um, agree. But it really is, though, honestly, because I think us as the independent artists is we never think about the business side. Or even when business side are even thrown at us, like when we got to do our taxes or anything like that, when those are thrown at us, we're just kind of just like, ugh, like I don't hear whatever, ugh, and everything like mm -hmm. that. But learning all this stuff, I mean, you could, you could figure out where to cut things and like where to like uh, – increase things and everything that business 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 i don't know much business but <laughs> so when it talks about expenses you want to keep them as low as possible for the cost of your goods without your quality loss so there will be times where like the paper that we buy or the ink that we get there's definitely a certain threshold that you can't go lower than because that paper is better and there will definitely be a little higher of a cost what are you doing i don't know what this is oh oops and get, you're distracting me now. Get Sorry. out of here. And uh, you'll definitely be at a point, especially when you're starting off, where you can keep costs very, very low. And I feel like the higher up you get or the more that you get into it, your costs, your expenses will get higher, but hopefully your uh, profit will also be increasing to cover those expenses. A good example of that would be a booth that we used to think was expensive would be 400 get... I'm moving to OBS so we could see the thing. Hold on. Is this going on your thing? Here we go. Perfect. All right. So uh, cost before would be like $400, and that would be seen as like outrageous to us. Where now we're spending at C2E2 booth was $2,200 or $2,200, and that's a huge jump. But we've gotten to the point where we know our numbers well enough, where we know that we can cover that if we sell a certain amount of prints, if we can do certain things. And the more that you know your numbers and the more that you know your business side, some, a number like 2200 seems more reasonable or more manageable, still intimidating, but it becomes more realistic that you can hit that and then some and still make profit after that. So when you know the business side, it becomes a lot easier to understand where you fall and can I afford this? And not only can I afford this, but I can definitely afford this and I want to make some profit from it. So my first piece of advice with the business side of things, even if you're not taking it super seriously... Get a business card, or get, sorry, not a business card. <laughs> get a credit card specifically just for business purchases. And I'm not going to go into the serious artist thing because when I, I'll, I'll mention it a little bit, but basically you want to keep track of things as much as possible and write things off. But if you have a credit card that's just for business, it's very easy to understand how much money you're spending towards convention life or towards your art. Because I think it can get very easy to just spend on like a debit card or with cash or whatever you might do. And all of a sudden you don't realize, well, how much did this convention actually cost me? But if you have it all tracked, you can be like, okay, so this is how much the booth was, this is how much hotel was, I bought prints, I bought paper, I uh, paid for a parking spot, I got a Airbnb. 
All of a sudden, all those expenses get put on a credit card. You can see your financial statement. Okay, this con cost me $960. And you can also figure out your net profit from that as well. Yes. Actually, good call. Mm -hmm. Because then when you get your gross profit amount at the end of the weekend, you do that minus your net, uh, or sorry, minus your expenses, which would be whatever is on this credit card. And then boom, that's how much money you made to you. Yep. So if I were you, I would definitely recommend getting a, a credit card for business. I'm not like a big proponent of credit cards, but I feel like this is a easy They're and- They're a little dangerous. If they can you, be yeah, dangerous. If you don't use them correctly. The way that I, re I recommend get a credit card is if you can actually pay it off. If you can pay it off every month and you don't have to worry about like interest fees or overages or overage charges, then that's when I would get a credit card. But if you're doing this, you should be able to afford it um, based on the profit that you're making. Hopefully, that's the goal. Because remember, the goal is to make a profit. Yeah. The next thing under that was travel in packs. As Sean always says, ducks fly ducks together. Ducks fly together. And it may sound silly, but you save so much money mm -hmm. by traveling uh, together. And that's why I think a lot of us in the house are very thankful to have each other. Travel smart. Yeah. Together. <laughs> what do you mean? Tell you about it later. Because if you get a hotel room, let's say that hotel room per night is like $200. If you're spending that all by yourself, that could be a $600 expense. Yep. But if you're spending that between 200 or just two people, all of a sudden that $600 just got cut in half. Three people, it's only 200 And the more that you go with more people, if you're comfortable like sleeping on the floor, which a lot of us are just willing to take that hit of like, yeah. I got a sleeping bag. I'm going to sleep on the floor so I can save an extra $75. Do it. And I think starting, especially starting off, do not be picky. And I'm going to say this to a lot of you because I, I've met people that were kind of picky starting off. And it's like, we are not making a lot of money. Yeah. And if there's a way that we can cut an expense out and we can make some more profit, why would we not do it? I feel like our most glamorous places that we stay in is here in the house. Because <laughs> when we go on conventions and everything like that, like I always feel like we're always sleeping on the floor. There's one of us that are always switching. And then, like we're also really nice when it comes to like, if there's a bed and everything like that, like we'll switch out. Like, hey, do you want the bed tonight or anything like that? But for the most part, I mean, we're sleeping on the floor and... All like that. There's normally nine people in the room and everything like that. Like, it's just, I mean, you, you just kind of yeah. got to, there's a difference between where people, a lot of people, I think they want this, you know, they, they want the, um, what is it? They want the most out of it, but they also want convenience. And, like, convenience definitely costs a little extra. Exactly. And even with the, I, I forgot to mention with the credit card thing, is you can rack up points, especially if you buy, I have a Chase Sapphire card, you rack up points. My, when I fly to WonderCon in a few weeks, the flight was free because I had enough points just racked up from uh, convention purchases. So it's something also to keep in mind. If you want to treat this a little more seriously, all of a sudden you can get things where that expense then becomes eliminated. And all of a sudden I can make more profit because of it. And the other thing really quick. Yeah, real quick. And then we'll uh, get to that comment was if you book on like booking.com or there's a lot of these hotel websites when I'm not, I'm not, once again, I'm not an ambassador for any of them, but oftentimes what they do is if you book five hotels, you'll get the six one free. And I've done that before where all of a sudden that's another expense knocked out. <clears throat> My net profit just went up by like 400, $500 just because I was using this website that wanted me to use them to book hotels. So if you're going to be traveling to a lot of these conventions, there are so many little tricks like that where you mm -hmm. can just save. Four hundred, five hundred dollars, even if it's smaller. I don't want to look over like the fifty dollars savings or a hundred dollars. I think we've done that before of like even parking spots of like not buying the lot right next to a con, but going yeah. a little further back and saving five, ten dollars, and that's per day. So all of a sudden, that ten dollar per day becomes forty dollars for the weekend. And that's forty dollars that you split amongst you, and that net profit mm -hmm. just goes higher. Like I said, convenience costs a little extra. Yep. All right, um, what did you want to say really quick? It's just funny. So Spongy said, she says, wolves hunt in packs, orcas travel in pods, ducks fly in braces, fish swim, uh, flu swim in schools, humans must tribe. And then <laughs> Red Panda says, pandas live in embarrassment, like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. So that's great. <laughs> okay, the, the next thing I have here, oh, we already talked about the prints. Uh, and then how many of each. So yeah, five to 10, roughly. I agree with Sean, though, if you are willing to take the risk and you want to print more for like a bigger show 10 to 15 maybe 10 to 20 mm -hmm. but just know that that's a risk and there's a chance that it may not sell and you I, may be left with i like don't know i always prints. think it's just better to be overstocked than understocked 
that's just my opinion. Yeah. You definitely you know. don't want to like I used to wear it as a badge of honor where I would like have a bunch of things sold out. And now that I'm doing you them more mad, seriously, honestly, you get mad. You get then, mad because you you lose money out of it. You lose profit. And remember, that's yeah. the goal of the game, of this monopoly game that we're playing. You want to make as much of the profit as possible. And if you sell out, guess what? You're losing money. And also too one thing is I know like a lot of us want to kind of sit there and be like, "No, like the art is what matters. Like I'm I'm an artist in the art first. And yes, the art does come first, but you Always. also need to make money. You really do. So don't be afraid to talk about this stuff. That's why that's why I think we split this stream into two sections, the art side, which is the fun and like the more genuine and honest side of how you feel about creating art. But then when it goes to the business side, put on a different hat. You're yeah. a different mindset completely. Wear Your only hat. goal is to make a profit and think of it like a game. If you just think of it like a game, it just makes it a lot easier in my opinion, because in my mind, it's just play money and you're trying to cut costs as much as you can to get that <clears throat> number as high as you can. It's okay. Anxiety babies. It's yeah. Okay. And really, there's no way of losing. I'm trying to think. The only way, actually, there is a way of losing. It's not even play. It's not even do it. Yep. If you're playing the game, if you're at least trying to do conventions, you're winning in some regard. Oh, Tidjal says, actually, this is, this is a good question. If you sell out, what if what if you uh, leave the last one hanging there and tell people that it's sold out, but yep. you'll send them... I send it to them or a little bit. I actually do this one thing to where I sell my displays at the very end of the show. Oh, do you really? Mm -hmm. I would do that, but I actually tape the name tags on, and it, it's too hard to get off. Yeah. But I've done, I've sold displays before, and then shipping it to them if they don't mind paying for the shipping. Yeah. I don't see the harm in that. Uh, I feel like there was something else I want to talk about the business size before I go into the last rant stuff. Rant. Because what to bring is more of gotcha. a not business side thing. Um, I guess if the last thing that, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, I guess we can do a quick question before that. Quick question. Yeah. So Spongy says, how do you find enough time in the day? I find with a full-time job <laughs> on top of trying to manage art when, when I get sick or have plans, my art gets put to the side. How do you know when you're ready to be an independent artist? You make the time. That's what it comes oh, down to. Oh, you sound to. like me now. You make the time, but you do, you really do. Like when it comes to that stuff and, it, and it's hard because like I, you know, I don't want to give you a mean answer. I don't want you to give you a thing, but anything like that. But when it comes to something that really, really matters to you, whether being it, whether you're an artist, a musician, a photographer, anything creative and everything like that, when you're first starting out, these things take a good amount of time. And a good amount of time can give you a good amount of a product or whatever you want. Um, so it's, it's sacrificing that time um, and you you make it for your work you get out what you put in that's the best yeah, that was way one of my yeah, that's the best final way points that i can say it so how do you know when you're ready to be an independent artist there's a lot of planning before that you know like there's there's some planning and everything like that like i said it's the amount of time that you want to give it and everything like that um but it's also like knowing if you're if you can financially i don't know give yourself that time because giving yourself time also costs money as well yeah. You know, think of it, I mean, you know, think of these people, you know, who have bills and everything like that to where it's like, you know, you have bills every month or rent and everything like that. If you can afford two months to yourself and everything like that, if you know that you can afford two months to yourself and after those two months, you'll be, you'll be set again, give yourself that two months. The way I see it is I'm kind of, I was in the similar boat that you are. I had a full-time job that I did enjoy, but when did you know that you were ready? I feel like there's a gut feeling that you have and it just lingers there. And you know that that's the way that you want to go, but you're mm -hmm. held back by a fear, usually a financial burden, and that's yeah. holding you back from taking the jump. It's, I think it's all mostly is a financial burden. And it was funny as I was talking to someone at Anime Milwaukee, and they were saying how their metaphor, I love it, was you try to get the boat as close to the dock before taking the jump. And then he was saying, hmm. for you, you might have been like on the dock, but the jump down was still scary. Yeah. And I was like, that is a great way to look at it, where I knew that I was already there. I just haven't taken that jump yet. And that financial security feels so good. But I want to tell you right now, it does not feel nearly as good as being an independent artist. I feel like there is an equal amount of work just because I realized that emails and doing a lot of this back end stuff with like Etsy and making prints and traveling to cons and getting like a California state license for selling things. It takes a lot of time and effort and it can be draining, but it's so worth it. And I'm not saying that everyone should do it. I think I was in a position where I was able to build a art career outside mm -hmm. of my own career. And because of that, it allowed me to take the jump 
and still have a, not only a reputation, but I had a supply of inventory that I could sell. I had art that uh, I already had a There's, social media following. There definitely and, is like a lot of self-assessment before finally being like, yeah. I'm going to make so it. So try to make it, the jump as easier as possible for Get you. Get the boat as close to the dock. Get the boat as close <laughs> to the dock, but just know. It's the best way. It's awesome. Even if the boat's on the dock, it's still up to you to jump. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. I'm right there with you. And even right now, I'm not 100% secure yeah, I mean, with even everything. Even then, we've been doing, you know, I mean, we've been independent artists. Like, well, I mean, you just started. I just started. Like that. But, I mean, when I was a tattoo artist, like, I was technically an independent artist. Um, and even then, I mean, you have months to where you just you just sit there and you, you're scared. But you keep yeah. doing it. That's the thing. Like, you just keep doing it, you know? Uh, Grace is asking, operating as an artist full-time, do you have to register yourself with the state as sole proprietorship, or is it something else? That is for the serious arts. I feel like I could do a stream on that later. I'm still very new to this, and I have to create a um, LLC or no a S corp, which I know that you guys do not want to hear about. Jocelyn actually answered the question for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, you have to be an LLC or an S corp. I'm going to be an S corp, and it's S -corp. boring. To be honest, that's the not so much fun. That is actually probably the I like business side of things, and even that gets to me of like oh and like when the roommates hear any of us or like when Pui came over they like immediately went to the front room closed the door <laughs> like does not want to hear it and to be honest i'm not that crazy about it the only thing i will say about if you're going to be a serious artist let me just give a quick laundry list write-offs are very important mm -hmm. start adding sales tax to your credit card purchases save every receipt you save spend. receipts have it be easy to organize for your if you're your own accountant or if you go to someone make sure it's easy to understand uh taxes you definitely want to report your taxes if you don't want to run into trouble with the irs uh, the other things were try to have a separate bank account it doesn't mean like a separate bank altogether but if you have a bank account like you're checking and savings i also have a third one called conventions and coming back from anime milwaukee or usually from any con whatever my expenses were at that con i will then transfer money from my checking account into my convention account because i know then when i have to order the booth for next year where i or if i have to order the hotel i can pull from the convention account not my checking or savings and that way i kind of always know how much money should i be spending on conventions without dipping into my personal savings and the last thing was to save and plan for the future not only financially but maybe as an artist having a bunch of art that you know you can build up and build your social media following mm -hmm. it's very important okay so we're gonna leave the business side like i said i'm what a big numbers this? person what is, this? what is this i know i'm gonna just shoot these off go for i have it. i have an entire list of things i wanted to at least mention before we uh end the stream and then we'll answer questions and we'll off because i know we'll probably go 15 20 minutes over here yes Okay, first thing I wrote down, and mind you, these are just kind of random thoughts that I was like, oh, I want to make sure that I get to them. Real quick, do you want to do a thing to where Faith is actually asking, do you get a business license for each state you sell at? Normally, the convention provides you with a business license if it mm -hmm. is big enough, where well, you just have to add, I think it's just like a what, like a ten, like a temporary sales license, I think it is, where I think it's just yes. like a quick like $10 to $20, I think. Um, for the most part, it all depends on the state that you go in, because some states don't require them. You can just go and set up and sell. Um, other states, if they do require them, then normally that's the convention's job to get you that license. Like California, you do have to get a, a license. But like yeah. when Illinois and Wisconsin and Minnesota, a lot of these do not require it, but they will give you a sales tax form. Yeah. So each state is different. I feel like that's something that you're going to have to figure out because we're still kind of learning it, but we're also learning that convention holds a lot of responsibility on that, not so much the individual. Mm -hmm. Okay. First thing I wrote, know your market and your audience. If you're going to an anime show, maybe include more animals. That's something that we've noticed sells better at anime shows than early as I've noticed than comic shows. And a fox will sell very, very well at All an anime show. All I do is sell animals, so. <laughs> <laughs> because the market of anime shows, usually there's a lot of people that enjoy animal stuff. And just something to keep in mind. Uh, next is learn from those around you and don't be bitter. Mm -hmm. The short story of what i'm about to say is four or three years ago we went to anime milwaukee with one of my friends cat she's a personal trainer does art kind of on the side as a hobby sold pokemon prints outsold pui <clears throat> and myself combined and mind you she did pokemon oh, stills cat. from a tv show a and she painted salesman. them and she is the best salesperson i have ever seen and 
Pui and I learned from that. We adapted, and now we stand behind our booth. We look at people. We inter- we engage with them. And not only that, but Pui really interacts to the point of pushing sales, kind of like a salesperson. And that's his agenda. It doesn't mean that'll work for you, but he has really adapted that since this whole cat situation. But at the end yeah. of the weekend, it was like, why is Kat making so much more money? I mean, she d- doesn't even take this very seriously. And you know what? It's that experience and she's a better salesperson. So swallow your ego and realize that other people are probably better at selling art than you are and learn from them. Third thing, focus on improving, never settle. Mm-hmm. Uh, what Pete That's was telling me. In life. Not even just sales actually, or experience yeah. or anything. Like that. It's just in life. Be obsessed with it is what Pete always tells me mm-hmm. because it's the ones that are, are the ones that make it. Uh, next You get out what you put in. Sean already said this, but I think it's good to reiterate this because if you put minimal amount of effort into your con life, you're not going to get much out of it. If you put a lot of effort, there's a good chance that maybe it won't pay off right away, but if you keep putting that maximum Mm -hmm. amount of effort, I feel like Pui is a great example. It'll pay out. Yep. It, It really is like a video game. You're just getting a lot of experience. But if you're only in like the first area and killing like the initial toads, yeah, you're doing a lot of work, but you're not gaining a lot of the experience. Level one bores. Yeah, so make sure you're also challenging yourself and you're pushing yourself to um, fight stronger battles. Next one was basically with um, staying relevant, staying current. Uh, I did pins and I tried to do magnets for a while, but if you look at the current market, enamel pins are where they are. Not like the buttons that I had. Enamel pins. But enamel pins and adapting to that. So if your entire inventory was pins like are the buttons that I made, there's a good chance that they will not sell as well because there's this new hot product that is cooler than these buttons and enamel pins have really taken the convention scene by storm. Maybe make a few yourself. Make a few of those enamel pins. I think Sean is trying to make one. I'm, mm-hmm. I've made a few in the past. Key has made some. And it's like you're adapting to what's current, what's trendy. Uh, next one is fail and fail often. I wrote it in bold because that's when you learn. And if I didn't fail as much as I did, I don't think I'd be where I am with conventions or even like learning the ins and out of booking hotels and realizing, oh, you can get a free hotel if you mm-hmm. order on a certain website or, oh, you can get a free flight to California if I just book it with this yeah. credit card that I use for expenses that I'm going to be spending on anyways. They're just little tricks and tips like that, that over time you're like, oh, 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 oh. And it goes through those failings to learn it. So someone could tell you all they want, what they've learned, but until you experience it for yourself and really like understand why that's important, I I don't think it'll register. Um, It's better to fail trying than to fail not trying. Yeah. Just know that. There you go. Next is your numbers are subjective. You can take notes mentally on what other people are making. I know me and my friends are very open with each other about how much money we make. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's appropriate to be sharing it live on a stream like this. And also, I don't know if it'll be relevant because what I make will be completely different than what Sean or Pui or Key. And it's very relative to our own earnings. So if at this show last year, I made more, great. And that's the number that I should be more aware of than how much money did Pui make versus how much money did I make. And you should focus on yourself first and foremost, and that's the numbers that matter, but take into account what everyone else is making so you kind of know where the market is and where the profit is going towards. I don't think it's a bad thing to share your numbers with your friends. I think it's one of those insider tips. Yeah, I mean, if they're comfortable with it. Oh, yeah, don't force any of your... If they don't want to share their number, don't pry it out of them. Just respect their decision. If they're comfortable with it and they want to talk about the show and the profit and how much they made off of it, then go ahead and talk to them about it. My next one was record your progress. You'll be proud of it. Kind of like Sean was saying, take pictures of Mm -hmm. your booth throughout the years. I wish I would have taken more pictures of my earlier booths because I can have a good laugh now. Uh, Go meet other artists. I feel like this one should be obvious, but a lot of artists just stand behind their booth the entire convention. And the only way that you're going to meet new artists or if you're going to have these interactions is... If you take initiative, and I I know a lot of you are <clears throat> thinking, well, I'm shy and I, I don't feel comfortable talking to artists. I was shy too. And you know what? I was thrown into situations where I had to be more interactive and more social, and it paid off so much because guess what? I learned they're just as shy and weird as I am, and we clicked. We connected. And now I, I feel like I have no, uh, what's that called? There is nothing holding me back from going to talk to an artist because what's the worst that can happen? They don't want to talk to me. 
Like, oh, well, like I have so many other people that I can go talk to. And I think as soon as you start to accept rejection and, hey, you know, I'm not going to be liked by everyone, then it, it becomes a lot easier you to talk to You want to make yourself uncomfortable. When you make yourself uncomfortable, that's yeah. – when you're uncomfortable, that's your, your – You're learning. It's kind of like this weird like fight or flight type thing to where you kind of put your brain into and then it's the it's the are you willing to be uncomfortable to grow. Yep. Uh, scan other boots. What do you like? What don't you like? And I think it's good to then talk with your friends of if they tried something new with their booth, did it work? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's not only can you learn from your own mistakes and your own uh, process of what you're doing, but learn from your friends. And I, that's why I think really having a pack of people that you trust and you can share things with uh, openly I forgot. helps so much. I forgot what convention it was to where Key did a convention and then she was she was struggling on Friday. Like she was having a tough time. And then she oh, got, yeah. she came in early Saturday, changed her whole booth, and then it was fine yep. after that. Yeah, I forgot what convention and I mean, a few of us were like, yeah, it could be better. Mm -hmm. And if you can take your friend's advice with like, not take it so personally and not be so emotionally attached and yeah. be like objectively viewing it, it you can learn a lot and grow from that. Like I said, swallow that eagle. Yep. The eagle. 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 Swallow the eagle. Eat swallow it all. Swallow the ego. Uh, next, be obsessed with improvement. We've talked about that a lot. Next is ask for help, ask for critique, and another pair of eyes can go a long way. Mm -hmm. And kind of like we were just saying with Keys, but same thing. Uh, going back to the presentation, treat everyone with respect. Be courteous. It, it really should be common sense, but it's not. And I think you will be a little one step above everyone else that isn't treating people with respect because even if your art's not better than someone else's, if you give someone like a really nice experience when they walk away from your booth, they're like, man, that was, that was a really awesome person. They might just support you for that. Mm -hmm. The girl that I was talking about earlier, Kat, we went to Belgium and she would sell things at shows. People didn't even know what Animal Crossing was, but they were buying prints from her because of the experience of just talking with her. And that just goes to show how good of a salesperson she is but also just being kind and treating people with respect and how far that can go. But if it's in genuine, people can read that too. Kat didn't really care if she made money or not at the show. So for her, she just wanted to meet people. She just likes talking to people. So it's not like she was being nice to make a profit. She was being nice because if she wasn't, she'd just be bored standing behind a booth. <laughs> Next is what may not work for someone else may work for you. You might hear a lot of negative critique about how things aren't working or this con didn't do well because it's all 16 year olds or, oh, well, this show is too small to make any real profit. That might be true for them. That might not be true for you. Mm -hmm. We've gone to smaller shows and made more money than the shows that are much, much bigger. And I'm yeah. talking about like shows where there's 10 artist alley boots versus like 150. I went to Emerald City last year. I made more net profit off of little anime St. Louis that had 10 artist alley boots. So something to keep in mind. Take people's word and I guess log it, but don't necessarily be like, okay, that's 100% fact. I'm not going to even try it for myself. Yeah. Try it for yourself still, but recognize that maybe what they said is true, but you still want to experience it for yourself. Create something new hasn't been done before. I think the first person that did enamel pins probably made bank. I think the first person that made the gold printed prints made bank. I think the first person that made the holographic Prince made bank. I think first person that made wall scrolls made bank. First person that made play mats made bank. I think there's things where, yeah, you might see what other people are doing in the market and just go off of what's trendy. But if you think of a different product that is new and unique, I, I think you'll soar. And I think one of the things that will stand out is independent art that is original mm -hmm. because you can't get that anywhere else. So then your product, it might not be revolutionary. It might just be ink on paper, but with the subject matter and what you drew might be unique to you and then that then it's unique to them um i don't know if i want to say this but i will just so that you're aware of it people at cons are great but you gotta be a little aware of leeches and never fall in love with someone's potential so if someone comes up to your booth and you can just kind of tell they are wanting a lot of bless you they're wanting a lot of information out of you but they don't actually seem interested in you as a person and they just want to get as much like factual information out of you i mean respect them but also know there have been people that have been at my booth for like a half hour that half hour is the time that you just i don't want to say wasted but it could have been spent talking to other people or it could have been talking to mm -hmm. potential buyers of your work and the time that you have at your cons is limited <laughs> angelo t 
Tim, can I have some money? <laughs> Angela's a great example. Yeah, Angela, great example, yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, but I, I guess going into the customer realm of things, if someone is spending a lot of time talking about their personal life or things that are n- clearly they're like on a tangent and it's going on for a long time, you have to find what Pui calls an out or a way to like respectfully t- let them know yeah. that you are trying to run a business and this is the only way that you get an income. So them just ranting for a half hour is hurting you on don't, a financial level. It's like a don't be rude, but with other people that are coming up to the booth, like acknowledge with them. Their, acknowledge the other people around them because then that also might tell that person who's talking right now, they, they might kind of get an idea like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. You know. Because, I mean, you'll have people who come in and they just suck your time up, you know? And that's not a bad thing. You could talk to them as much as you can, but at the same time, you are still working. Think of it that way. Yeah. You're working. And the last thing that I wrote here is know your actual profit. That's your net profit, not just your gross profit. Because, yeah, gross profit numbers can be really impressive. And someone at the end of the year might be like, yeah, I made $56,000. And you're like, well, gross profit. What's your net profit? And if you did the numbers, it's probably closer to like thirty-eight or forty. Oh, I make four hundred bucks. So that's fourteen grand. That yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine they're expensive? Or you know what? Wait, wait, wait. Actually, I'm gonna do one last thing with you guys because this is an actual experience, and I think it's good to see. I made eleven thousand on my Kickstarter, right? Holy God! I've had so many people think that I just banked eleven thousand in my bank account, and I'm like rolling in the deep. It's funny because that number's there on Kickstarter, and they like. That's the, like the idea that people are like, oh my God, like that's in their bank account right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. Mm-mm. The books themselves cost five and a half grand. The custom boxes that I made were about 2000 And then the uh, shipping, which the roommates had to see, that was like three grand. We all had to help. Man. And I'm not I even... helped you. Yeah, and they helped. I'm not even talking about the prints that I put in or the little car- cards or the thing that I wrapped the books or the um, packing peanuts. So just on this alone, let me just do, this is 10, what am I doing? I can buy those. So, oh, yeah, look at this. So guess what? This number of people thinking I walked away with $11,000, this minus $10,500, I was left with $500 profit. But, but, think of it this way. So it's the return. Exactly. So by doing bulk order, that it was initially like seven thousand, but since I ordered a thousand, it came down to five thousand five hundred. So if I had a thousand books and then I sold like two hundred on Kickstarter, I have eight hundred extra books that I have in my basement essentially. Each book I sell for forty five. I'll do this math on a calculator just so I don't screw this one up. Calculator. Calculator. So that means I have in my basement essentially sitting $36,000. Nope, don't do that, John. What? Oh. (laughs) You went to Tumblr. Oh, my bad. So this is a good way of explaining that I have potential to make $36,000, but my actual profit, my net profit was $500. Mm -hmm. So just know, and when you see other artists on Kickstarter... over time? Like you have the books and... Every time yeah. that you set, like every time that, so now that that's what you have, but now that you got all the expenses and everything out of the way, now that's when you can make profit to where you have 500 on top of yep. whatever else you do over time. So to kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Exposure and books are sweet. I do like books. I have book. But it's the idea that you have to spend a nickel to make a dime. So yeah, I might've had to spend this and actually it was probably closer to like 12,000 with the packing peanuts and the shipping to international and the ones that I had to reship, whatever it might be. But this is my dime in the end, which is the 36 grand. That's not going to happen this year. It'll probably happen within a few years, but you have to have that initial cost to make a profit. And I think this is a larger scale. Put it on a small scale. If you're going for a small convention, Mm -hmm. your initial cost might be like, let's say $500, but in the long run, you could make a thousand. And yeah, initially this number can be intimidating. I know what it's like when $500 was a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And to have that be just an investment for something that you may or may not get in the future, it's scary. And money can be scary. That's why I try to treat it like a game and not treat money so seriously. But if you're interested in the business side, try your best and to the best of your ability to get informed and try to keep your expenses as low as possible. That way it comes easier to make a higher net profit in the short game and a lot of net profit in the long game. 
Okay, I guess let's take any last minute questions and we will end it off here. Um, do we do? Uh, okay, yeah, we got that. One, yeah. All right, Queen Cornetto says, what is your most essential stationary supply to bring to cons, such as tape, etc." Oh! Oh, there you go. Oh, they're... What to bring? Sorry. <laughs> I, I won't write it because it will take too long. But ready? Here we go. Scissors, tape, a Sharpie, a trash bag, pencils or pens, probably for signing, food or drink. Con food can be super expensive, yes. so bring your own. Imagine buying food from like an airport or like a whatever it's called. Yep. A movie theater. That's how much it is. A uh, square reader for credit card purchases. Change in a lot of it and keep it relevant to your stuff. So if you sell stuff for 15, guess what? A lot of people are going to pay with the 20. You should have a lot of fives. And the last one is I like to keep a little book with me to keep track of each con, how much I did, how much was on cash versus card. And did I try anything new? Like what did legend. I learn? Yeah, exactly. So those are just some, I forgot to even mention so that. That was the quick thing. Okay. Um, Fate says, I use a debit business card and keep track of it with a ledger. You don't have to worry about the bill coming in. Good job, Faith. We got that one. Got that one. Well, hello, Max from Austria. Oh, next day. <laughs> Uh, Faith says, do you know the rules about paying yourself and taxes on that? Yeah. I'm learning a lot with S Corp, but something that if you're interested in, it, there's like a whole rabbit hole you can go down. Um, but like I'm making an S Corp, so I have to hire myself as an employee. It's a very weird process. And uh, maybe I'll explain it on a different stream for those who are more serious, but it's pretty boring. Da, da, da. Spongy says, do you find yourself with a different persona or confidence with streaming or at conventions? I noticed with debate teaching or streaming, I'm much less less shy. The way I look at conventions and when I stream is like you have to step up for the occasion. So best my foot forward. Yeah, put your best foot forward. So my ideal scenario would be me in front of a TV, not talking to anyone, just drawing. Like that to me, that's like heaven if I could picture it. But when I'm at this type of scenario where I have to be talking, I have to be interacting with people, or if I'm at cons, I'm gonna give it my all. And it's something that I think my parents always taught me is whatever you do. Do your best at it. Even if you're not good at it, like you could put me like building stairs or like pouring cement. I know I'm not going to be good at it, but I'm going to give it the best effort that I have in me because that's all I can give. And if I can give everything I can, what more can be asked mm -hmm. of me? Like I said, I mean, technically with this, like we're presenting to you guys. So presentation is key. Yeah. We're trying to make this as professional as we can. Digital says, could you quickly talk about cash money versus card reader? Card readers are when people pay with a credit card. There's PayPal, Square. I know there's a few other weird ones. but One goes in your wallet. One goes in the computer. Yep. And <laughs> cash is untraceable. I mean, that's something that there's a lot of hush-hush about. But uh, reporting it is definitely different where if you have a card, you definitely have to report it because it's uh, right there. It's trackable. And that's why you want to apply sales tax if you're going to treat it more seriously. And thank you, Spectre 4 for following. Spectre 4. Um, just to be aware of. And they're super cheap. They're like 10 bucks. But then if you uh, sign up with like Square, you get 10 bucks put back on. So it's essentially free if you yeah. just take the time to get it. Spongy says, I just met with Mitten, Mitten here in Columbus, and I'm so happy. Artist personalities are so liberating. I'm so happy to start building a tribe. Good. Awesome. Oh, that's awesome. That's literally the coolest thing I've heard this week. <laughs> no, I'm glad that like the community is like, branching out and like meeting each other. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Nightfish says, do you guys take in commissions during cons? I used to, but no more. No. I'm one of those people that I would be the head down drawing, and I learned sitting next to Cat, being attentive, being aware of the people in your surroundings works way better in your favor. So if you want to take commissions, just take commissions for after the con. I know our old roommate, Ashley Cloverkin, she would take commissions on the spot, but then complete them and ship them out in her own time. Mm -hmm. So she would just still be standing and being attentive, but still take commissions. It all depends too. Like if you're an artist and you do like very quick, you know, like if you know that you're a fast artist and a quick artist and can get something done quickly, then if you know that you can do a, convent or a commission and you feel confident, then do a commission. If you're more of a slower, more meticulous, more planned out artist, don't, don't feel bad about not taking commissions. Don't, don't feel bad about saying no. Yep. I've said, I say no at least like three or four times every con. I say no all the time for commission. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Spectre Four says really quick. I used to look at your art and channel on CG Cookie. Are you on here from now on? Sorry for the off topic question. Yes. So every Wednesday at two p.m., this is the channel to look for. Oh, I got a question. What? I got a question. Where? Specifically for me. This is Art of Price. Oh yeah, go. How did you get into the Change in the Artist Collective? They invited me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I met them back in Spectrum. Uh, it was a year ago. And then I stayed in contact with them, and then they eventually just, they had a spot open, and they eventually um, invited me. Bam. Angel says, Sean, can I get a, can I get a commission? No. <laughs> Chris813 <laughs> says, was starting off sharing a booth helpful, or should one bypass a step due to complications? Bypass it. Bypass it. Never share a booth if you have an artist alley booth, because you only have six feet to work with, and then all of a sudden that goes from six to three. Mm -hmm. Can you, I... I have worked with three shared tables. I have done horrible at every single one. There hasn't been one shared booth experience, except for one where Key and I did share one, but we each had 10 feet to work with, so it wasn't really a shared booth. If you have a lot of space to work with, yes. Wait, both of you had 10 feet It was to the work corner with? at Oh My God Con. Oh my Lord, yeah. So we somehow got a corner at Exhibitor. So we thought we were going to share 10 feet. We ended up getting kind of a 20-foot booth where it was split at an angle, so we each got 10. But if you have a six foot booth, it is so hard to make a profit with three foot um, or a three foot space to work with. So I would just bypass it. Unless if you have a 10 foot booth and you can share it, that makes a little more sense. If you're starting off, yeah, you each get five feet. How are you plan to deviate that? But I mean, me and Sean have learned from at MMA Milwaukee, we were going to share a booth. But when we got to the booth, we clearly saw right away it just it wasn't going to work. It was not big enough. And, you know, Sean, even though it's his second year, even he has more stuff than what a shared booth could offer. So it would be cramped not just for him, but definitely for me. And we just decided not to do it. Just Are you looking at your phone Key on the stream? He texted me. He asked about, sorry. Oh, boy. This kid. What a millennial. <laughs> okay. Adrian says, when is a good time during the con to approach you to talk without taking up too much of your time? I mean, if you notice that there's no customers, come on up. I don't know. Even if there are customers, just come on up because... It, it, Actually, yeah, that's that like subjective to us to where like if, if you watch the streams, you introduce yourself. Like, of course, we're going to talk to you. Yeah. You know? So I don't... I think it's... Uh, just be aware if, if you're talking for a long period of time, there's other people around you or behind you trying to pay. Just, you know, be like, oh, you know what? Let's take care of them first. I'll come back later or like something. Uh, what was the... Oh, yeah. The last thing that I'm going to share with you guys, if you're going to do conventions, something that we did two years ago that was kind of fun, we had a bingo card. And if you want to have this behind your booth and like take little notes or stamp it. <laughs> what is it? You can play this little game. And if you have a bunch of friends. Wait, what is this? I've never seen this. That It was two years ago. So we made this. Or no, we found this business card. This wasn't even our bingo card. Is there a bingo card? Oh, yeah. dude, this is a convention so like, scavenger hunt. Yeah, so some of them will be, uh, can I take a picture, awkward collar and leash couple, little kid without a parent, and basically you put a stamp on Cosplay it. Cosplay almost takes out the spray. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus <laughs> if does. There's so many. There's been so many. All right, so if in Overwatch <laughs> with Mercy, with the wings, yeah. there's so many times where I've had her just like turn around and then just like, poof, just like took out so many things. <laughs> <laughs> that just happened oh my god so beautiful. if you guys want to look for one i know we always joked about creating our own we never did i think just because a lot of us are so busy oh, like pooey wouldn't be able to participate anymore but this is something kind of fun starting off because usually you're not as busy so i definitely recommend it it was a like, it was pretty funny <laughs> Yo, we had two <laughs> can, dude, can people. you break a 100 <laughs> bonus if it's friday <laughs> oh Actually, angela that's a really cute commish what was the commish those are characters that ball. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. Angela, good. I like that one. Okay. I like Angela. Well, I think that's all that we got for the stream day. I hope you guys learned something new. I, I think just to reiterate, have fun with it. Don't treat it too seriously, but also take interest in the business side because it can help save you money. And I think feel as artists, oftentimes money is a problem. And I, I hate hearing when money becomes such a burden on an artist's life that they can't yep. do art anymore. So if you can just take a little bit of an interest in the business side to hopefully help lessen that burden, I think that's where I try to help out as much as I can because I have an interest in numbers. But what Sean was saying before, the art side should always come first and foremost because yes. if you create art that <clears throat> feels genuine and it's really good quality and you're pushing yourself, people will respond to that and people will buy it regardless of price or whatever the business stuff on the back end. 
They just want to support you as an artist. So that's very important. So yeah, that's all I got for the show. I know we went a little long. Do you have any last minute? Or do you have any last bit of advice that you want to leave people with about conventions if they want to get started? About conventions? Yeah. Or just about life? <laughs> conventions should be fun. And so, like, when you go into it, like, try not to be too stressed out about your numbers, especially if it's the first. I think I think Maria, she just did her first one, Miss Chibi, she did her first one, and mm-hmm. she came into it, and she didn't have anything to base off of it. And that's a really good thing. Like, go into it with a blank slate. Each one, you should go into it with a blank slate, you know? You should have a goal in mind, but also know, like, if you don't hit that goal, try it again next time, you know? Keep trying. Yeah. The only way you fail, like we said, it's just not try. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I'm going to leave you guys with is there's no right time to start doing them. Just apply to the local one that's near you, or even if it's a big one, apply to it. Get in. And even if you fail hard, guess what? You're on the right path. <laughs> so that's all I got. Thank you guys so much for coming to this live st- or this. I was going to say this YouTube stream. This live stream, I will put it on YouTube. Uh, not all of the streams I think we do I'll put on YouTube. I'll put the ones that I feel had a lot of information or context yeah. that would be, would be rewatchable. On I think this one would be a good one. So thank you guys so much for coming, and hopefully we'll see you next week. I don't think Sean will be with me next week. He might be out of state. I'll be in Ohio. But I'll probably be or bringing I'll be driving on. back. I'll most likely bring Key on for the show, and we'll have a little fun digital art battle or something. I know her and I uh, can do something funny. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned for next week. But besides that, thank you guys so much for coming, and we're going to Subway. I'm starving. Yeah, we're going to Subway. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye, 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 bye. Bye. bye.